We give God the praise. We give him the honor. We give him the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It is yet another Shabbat night. It is Friday, October 22nd, 2021 in the year of our Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, welcome to GFM Friday night's Law and Order. Amen. Praise God. We give God the glory. We give him the honor. We give him the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 church, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't know about you guys, but I was looking forward to tonight. I'm saying, Lord, it's it's promising to be a really great night tonight. Amen. It will be a continuation of Leviticus chapter 11. This will be part two of two. Okay. So be forewarned. So if you're not able to, you know, stick it out for the long run, um, just know that this will be in the archive. So welcome to everyone, those that are here with us on Zoom and those that are out there um, tuning in through Facebook or through YouTube. We just want to thank the Lord for you guys. So go ahead, grab your pen, your paper, you know, grab it, your, your Bible or it's on your phone. However, grab it all because tonight there, there's going to be a lot to be uncovered. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So we give God thanks for life. So let us bow our heads in prayer in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth as we usher in the Holy Spirit of God, as we surrender this altar, we surrender this night, this Bible study, because none of us came here, including my own self. And I'm certainly sure, Sister Jennifer, we didn't gather here to hear man. We gathered here to hear the Lord speak. And we want to hear what he has to say to his church. And you know, Whenever he speaks, things have a way of turning around. You know, chains have a way of breaking. Deliverance have a way of coming forth. So we know there is going to be shifting in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So let us just let, let us just, uh, you know, encourage, encourage the Lord to draw near to us right now because we need his presence. Otherwise, we can't do what we came here to do. You know, like Moses says, show me your glory. I will not go anywhere unless your presence go with us. Amen. So praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. There is a place. There is a place. A place where we can go a place where we see his face i say there is a place there is a place there is a place where we can go and behold his face. In the beauty of his holiness, in the beauty of his righteousness, in the beauty of his holiness, there is a place, there is a place, 
place there is a place that we can go there is a place there is a place there is a place where we can go and behold his face in the beauty of his holiness in the beauty of his righteousness in the beauty of his holiness there is a place that we can go hallelujah there is a place that our spirit man just join now to go to that place that we can behold the face of our lord in his beauty it's beauty that is so awe-inspiring to behold. Ah, thank you, Lord. As before your splendor, even Isaiah fell at your feet. He says, ah, I am undone. Hmm. I'm a man of unclean lips who dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And I have seen the Lord. Oh, Lord, was to experience you in the beauty of your holiness. In the beauty of your righteousness. Won't you take us to that place so we can behold your holy face. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as we come, one and all, you know us all by name, as we gather before your throne, before this altar tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray, O oh Father, that you will extend your hand of mercy over us. Touch us all from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet. Lord, as we come and we surrender ourselves to you, to behold your beauty, to behold your holiness, to behold your face. Lord, we come and we say, we are but flesh Sinners even, oh God, oh, our need of a savior, oh Father. So we pray as we come that you will forgive us of our sins because, Lord, there's none, none that is without sin. So we lay bare before you now our sins and we ask that you would forgive us. Lay no charge against us this night, Abba Father, but that you will draw us near, near to the fire, near to your beauty, near to you. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, O oh, Father, that will, Lord God, behold the sign and the wonder of the burning bush that burned in the midst of the wilderness that Moses had to draw near. May men and women draw near this night, O oh Father, to come to see what is burning, O oh God, on this altar, as you burn in the hearts of your people, as you burn in the hearts of your mind. Lord, as you go forth, Lord God, hallelujah, and to possess the reins of our heart, to take possession of these vessels, O oh God, that has committed themselves to you. Lord God Almighty Jesus, for your use, for your glory, 
glory, for your honor, for your praise, that when men and women shall behold, O oh God, to see us, that they won't see us, but that they will see you. So, Lord, let, O oh God, your light shine forth. Lord God, let it illuminate your very word, O oh God, your word that go forth tonight, O oh God, to break chains Oh God, Lord God, to Lord dismantle, Lord God, and cast down altars, Lord God Almighty Jesus, Father God, to uproot. Oh God, Lord Jesus, Father, this night, Father, and deliver us from the evil that which that had kept us bound, even in our ignorance, will be at no effect this night, because Lord. You are reversing and returning back to sender this night. Every lie, Lord, every defilement, every contaminant, Lord God, every perversion, returning, every confusion, returning back to sender this night. Because this night, Lord, this Shabbat night is our deliverance from the lie of the enemy from confusion, from misunderstanding, Lord, from ignorance. Tonight you're making things plain. So we come and we ask that you will send your food to feed us. Give us your water to drink. It is pure. Lord, that when we leave, we will be full. Lord, so satisfied that we have to go and tell. We give you thanks right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior, and soon coming King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome everyone again. Hallelujah. Welcome. It is week number 37. Can you believe it? 37, week number 37. And we are continuing on with Leviticus chapter 11. You know what happened last week, all of the stirring. Be thou stirred again. Amen. Praise God. So let us welcome my dear sister, who the Lord is going to be using tonight. And, and all of us. You know, just uh, don't be afraid. Ask your questions. And uh, Sister Jen will come and bring forth. And uh, we will have some arguments to present at the end because I know you have a lot of questions, right? Okay. So we're bringing it forth. Amen. Praise God. Sister Jen. Amen. Hey, sister. Can you hear me? Okay, I just wanted to make sure because I um, I'm sensing a little. I think there's a little bit of an uh, internet connection um, latency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a little bit. But delay. as long as hey, we gonna pray that it's stable. <laughs> Amen. Um, so we just Lord, we just pray for the reception, Father God. I just pray that Father God, everything that um, you want to declare tonight, Father God, that there would be no interception, Father God, that it would be a direct. Father God, um, that you would keep the line of communication open, direct line of communication, Father God. I just thank you for this evening. And I just thank you, Lord, that uh, what needs to be said and what needs to be heard will be done tonight in accordance with your will, Father God, for this day. So we thank you once again for this Sabbath and we bless your holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. So everyone, welcome. And we want to thank you for being here tonight for uh, a continuation of Leviticus 11. So Leviticus 11 is very, very, um, it, it is a heavy chapter. And by the <laughs> grace of God, we will get through the rest of it tonight. Um, but there's things that we can definitely, um, we definitely want to bring to your attention tonight as we have uh, dove into the scriptures and um, again, what we want you guys, uh, when, we, when we study this, um, we want you guys to, one of the things that we always reiterate is that although it's the scriptures, let's look at why things were written from the perspective of the heart of God. 
Um, God has a heart for his people. He has a heart for his creation. He has a purpose for everything under the sun, including uh, the animals, including the, you know, the earth. Uh, as we had mentioned last week, you know, when the Lord created the earth, he gave every seed bearing plant to man as food. Um, over time, we had discussed that um, when the fall of man had come, and, you know, the time of Noah had come and he had um, delivered Noah and his family from the flood through the ark, that when they came off the ark, um, that the Lord also told them that everything that moveth along the ground, I give you, um, you know, I give you. So there was an introduction of, there was that introduction as for man to be able to partake of specific animals as meat. Now, when we fast forward to Leviticus, there was a restriction that God had to put on man when it came to certain foods that, um, you know, the Israelites could eat and could not eat. And, you know, the restriction was based on the distinction, distinction between what is clean and what is unclean. So we were able to get through, um, uh, I'm going to put my Bible up here. We were able to get through um, Leviticus chapter 11, <laughs> 1 through 7, but we're going to try to get through the rest of the chapter uh, this evening. And so what I want to um, focus on for this week, we wanted to touch on the sea creatures, but we, we didn't get into that last week. So we are going to begin with um, the verses that address the sea creatures. So if you do have your Bibles, we want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 11, and we're going to start with verse 9, and um, we're just going to go through the verses that deal with the sea creatures. We're going to break it down into sections based on the creatures that the Lord um, was distinguishing as clean and unclean in the scriptures. So we are, I, I am reading from the New International Version. That is the version that we use whenever we do our studies. If you have another version, that's fine, but please follow along as much as you can. So in Leviticus chapter 11, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start and I'm going to read the first couple scriptures regarding the sea creatures. And then what I may do is call on Sister Lena or so I'll call on Sister Carolina if she is able um, to read the other scriptures pertaining to the other creatures that we're going to discuss in regards to clean and unclean. And I really enjoyed um, Sister Lena and I kind of just piggybacking off of each other. So we're going to do a lot of that this week as well. So I'm really excited for what God is going to reveal to us. So it says in verse nine, of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales. But all creatures in the seas and streams that do not have fins and scales, whether among all the swarming things or among all the other living creatures in the water, you are to regard as unclean. And since you are to regard them as unclean, you must not eat the meat. You must regard that the car their carcasses as unclean. Anything living in the water that does not have fins or scales to be is to be regarded as unclean by you. So that's verses nine through 12. That deals that deals with the creatures of the waters. So one of the things, if you have a different version of the scriptures, like if you don't have a new international version, in other versions, which I believe primarily the, the New King James Version, they use the term, they don't, they use the term unclean, but some use the term abominable um, or an abomination. Some of them use the term to test, you are to detest. And so I know growing up when I heard the term abomination, it was always, I read it a lot because I read a lot of the New Testament growing up. I did read some of the Old Testament, but I read a lot of the New Testament. And so when you heard that term abomination, it was often regarded, it was often used in regards to the, um, the abomination of the the that the great woman in scarlet that was described in Revelation um, it was just always, the, it was always re used to regard an act, an act or something like that. Like it's a very abominable act. Um, in this, in this text, abominable or, you know, detest 
you know, when we hear the word detest, it, you know, we think of hate and that is, that is what it means. But in this case, what it's basically saying is this is something that should be regarded, like it says, as unclean. It should be regarded as kind of disgusting, something that you would not partake of because it, it's disgusting. And so and the Lord was wanting his people to establish that there's certain things that you shouldn't eat, not just because of the fact, not just because of the fact that, you know, perhaps it's, it's not good for them to, for, to partake of this a certain type of um, animal as food based on what we had discussed last week and what the purpose of each animal is, but because even the thought of even eating that type of animal would be disgusting to them. Like in, in the United States, you know, let's just, let's just use, I don't know, let's just use a, a dog or a cat or, or a raccoon or a possum. I'll just use possum as an example. <laughs> a possum is not really, uh, maybe let, let's even use a skunk. Like if you think of a skunk, a person would not, a person over here probably would not regard a skunk as food. Um, you know, for them, even the thought of eating a, a skunk would be disgusting. So it was in the same way, like it should be such a disgust to you that even the thought of eating it would just kind of, you, you would just kind of be like, no, I, I couldn't eat something like that. That's what I, I, I know that the Lord was trying to establish with his people. So when it comes to the sea creatures, um, there is some content that I want to, um, that I want to bring up. Um, and basically in the text, when it regarded the sea creatures, um, it was, it did say, it mentioned that, hold on, let me pull up my notes. Um, when it came to the sea creatures, the main thing that the Lord said was that anything that did not have scales and fins, you know, or anything that had scales and fins was deemed as clean. Anything that did not. So if it had scales, but it didn't have fins, it was not, it was not necessarily regarded as clean. If it had fins, but it didn't have scales, it wasn't regarded as clean. Um, and clean in the sense that you could not partake of that as a, as a meat to eat. So the way they distinguished between something you could eat and couldn't was unclean and clean. Um, so, but I, 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 I found something that I thought was interesting and this is sister, I may want you to, um, to kind of hone in on this a little bit too. So there is a scripture that, that says in, I, I'm not sure. I think it's in the New Testament, but it talks about, you know, I think it's in Revelation. It says anybody that adds to these words, you should not Revelation. add. Revelation okay. 22. Revelation about, 22. Yes. You, you already know where I'm going. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> do not add anybody that adds words to this, to this book or anybody that takes away words this, from this book you know, it's, you, you should not do that. And so that can even include the authorities of those that were actually given the law. So over time, and we've talked about this sister, there have been rabbis, there have been Jewish leaders, there have been those that actually came, you know, from the, the, the tribes of Israel, that over time, um, and, and it's, it's, there's biblical accounts of it, that there have been laws added to the original laws that, that came from, you know, came from Moses. And so when I was looking into the, um, some more information regarding the clean and the unclean, especially when it came to the sea creatures, um, I thought this was interesting. And it says, in regards to clean and unclean fishes, the authorities of the Talmud have also made some additions to the regulations in the scriptures. And that, again, here they are adding to the regulations. While it is stated in Leviticus, Leviticus 11.9 that only fishes are to be considered clean, which have scales and fins, the Mishnah declares that all fishes with scales have, doubtless, fins also. <clears throat> According to this, all fishes have scales but no fins 
may be all fishes having scales but no fins may be eaten as under that opinion it may be taken for granted that all scaly fishes have fins apparent exceptions are accounted for by the supposition that sometimes fins are so small or rudimentary that they cannot be distinguished on the other hand a fish with fins may be without scales and thus and and thus be unclean so for me when i read that it's funny what it what it sounds like that they're saying is that anything that has um one second i'm sorry anything that has that has scales would be deemed as also having fins so you know they're saying that um uh fit, basically for the fish to be clean it has to have both what it sounds like these these those that the authorities of the Talmud are saying is that well if a fish has scales it would automatically have fins but that that doesn't necessarily that's, that's not necessarily true and i definitely want your interjection sister um I'm... <laughs> because i have looked at some sea creatures are you there sister you're frozen okay she will be coming back on okay you froze for a moment are you there Sister Jen, oh, this is this is getting good, guys. As she's as she's as she's, you're on mute. You're mute. You're on. Okay, all right. Go ahead and talk, sister, so we can hear you. Make sure we can hear you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Lord, I want to pray for this reception. <laughs> in Jesus' name. It's okay. Yes. It's okay. Yes. You know what? Then you can always call in. Okay. If that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. You can call me coming on your on your phone. Right. Um, I want to jump in because yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up right now, just in case. You know, because the you referenced the Mishnah. So I wanted to remind everybody what the Mishnah is so you get an understanding of who is speaking, not just this body, but the Mishnah is considered the oral Torah. Now, we did this a ways, a ways back in when we were doing Exodus chapter 20, if you want to go back and, and you know, look, look about with the Mishnah, okay? Well, the Mishnah is the Oral Torah is a collection of written commentaries, what they call mystical commentaries on the written Torah. So it's like, you know, you and you, you get your concordance and you, you doing your research on Bible scripture, and then you get your like Matthew Henry or, you know, um, any of the other guys that write commentaries on the different um, chapters of the Bible. Well, these are um, these men write commentaries on a written work, which includes the work of Kabbalah. Okay, and it, that's that's where the mysticism and all this mess come in. Okay, this is going way back into pagan when Jewish Judaism has already got a little bit tainted. Okay, and it says um, it was first published as the Zohar by Shimon Bar Yochai in 170 CE, and it was written in medieval Aramaic and medieval Hebrew. The Zohar is intended to guide Kabbalists in their spiritual journey. Does this sound like, you know, going to Mecca? <laughs> okay, helping them to attain the greater levels of connectedness with God that they desire. It's an occult knowledge of the mystical secrets of the metaphysical universe, which is a part of Jewish tradition that deals with the essence of God. Be very careful. So what these people have done is that they have taken the written word and said that it basically is not complete and they have now added on to it and they have now interpreted it because even within my research, one of the fish that I came upon was swai. 
okay and swai uh does have some tiny scales right but it is from the um it's from the group of catfish but it's a different kind of catfish and so there are some jews that say it is okay to eat but the swai itself is unclean because it is a bottom feeder but some people say it's not a bottom feeder and it's full of toxins where did toxins come from when you go down deep okay so we need to be very careful what we are receiving because the world today they are interpreting things to to make it more appealing because it's like if i want to do something certainly i can find a scripture in there that will help me to itch my scratch but as the bible says in revelation 22 18 and 19 one to the one that add and one to the one that takes away you know um so they're playing with fire amen are you there sister yes can you see me and hear me yes, yes. yeah and and to add to that you know what I was saying about them saying that anything that has scales automatically has fins and is considered clean. But another creature that is in the sea that actually has scales is eel. And an eel it doesn't have any is fins. Actually, it doesn't have any fins, exactly, but it has scales. And so what's amazing is that in that text, they're saying that if it has scales, it would automatically have fins based on what they're saying, but that's not necessarily true. And so there are some things that I wanted to share about the eel um, before we move away from, from this subject that I just, I, the, the point I'm, again, if it's, it, it, we have to, we have to read the scripture and whatever the scripture says is what is law. So even if over time man adds to that, if that is not scripture, that is not the law that God gave. So we want, I want us to be mindful of that. But um, when it comes to the eel, what's interesting is that um, many creatures commonly called eels are, there's different types of eels. Uh, it includes electric eels, um, which are fish, rubber eels, which are amphibians, and spiny eels, slimy eels, swamp eels, and eel catfish. Only members of the order, um, uh, I think it's an anguil anguilliform an anguilliforms, are true eels. These include freshwater eels, worm, and spaghetti eels. Eels are generally predators and carnivores, and sometimes they're cannibals. Eels generally won't bother fish of a similar size but do actively hunt smaller fish eels also eat um, invertebrates crustaceans shrimp crabs and sea urchins eels kept in captivity may consume meat items such as beef hearts i said it beef hearts most eels don't eat other eels but some will and then it says um, some eels move back and forth from between freshwater and ocean environments. In those varying environments, eels may select from a wide, wider range of food items, including mosquito larvae and worms. Yuck. While while eels prefer to to while eels prefer to eat live prey, spiny and freshwater eels will eat carrion and will accept frozen blood worms and affects worms as food. The point I'm making is Sister that, Jen? Um, Sister wider, Jen? The eels, like it's the, the one of the, the diets for them is Sister Jen? Sister Jen? Can you yes. call in your your um your freezing and your um your breaking up? Can you can you yes. call in instead, please? Um, I checked it on YouTube and you're you're frozen. Your face is still frozen. Um, would you mind can calling you in, please? Me? Because 
um, no, you're, you're, you're going in and out. And we need to hear what you have to say, because the Lord has given you a lot of revelation on this, and we want to capture it all. Okay. I see you now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I'm going right. to um I'm going to try to call into um but the view that I'm looking at right now it's it's working so far. <laughs> okay. Um but so Go ahead. what I was what I was saying was that there are invertebrates that the the eels eat they 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 feed off of them and invertebrates include like crustaceans shrimp crabs now a lot of us that is part of our daily diet but i'm sure people know this but most uh of the crustaceans that we eat like the ones that we normally eat like crabs shrimp lobster those type of uh, sea creatures obviously do not have fins and they obviously do not have scales. So technically they are unclean animals. And these are the animals that eels also eat. Um, the other thing about these animals, the crabs and you know the, the shrimp is that they are bottom feeders. So they feed off of, again, very similar to the pig. They feed off the waste in the sea. So that's often why they are creatures that walk along the sand and they're, they're the waste management of the ocean. So as much as everybody likes crabs, as much as everybody likes their shrimp, and I am not going to lie, every once in a while, I have had shrimp. Um, it is not part of my daily diet. Crab, I, I don't even remember the last time I even had crab. Um, but they are bottom feeders. So... When we as individuals partake of these questions, which we are actually based on, you know, biblical record, you know, biblical law, we should not be eating these. And people, we have met, we had talked about this, how people will find scriptures, it's fine to eat anything, you know, God blesses everything. And um, I think when we spoke, sister, there was a scripture that you wanted to reference that most people will use to condone the fact that they just like to eat certain things. Right. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that in the scriptures, um, the truth of the matter is in this particular, in the scriptures, they do not have scales. They do not have fins. We should not be eating them. Um, and on top of that, in the same way with the pig, these are, these are sea animals that God purposed to, to clean the ocean. That's why when you look at a shrimp, oftentimes you see this black little line inside the back of the shrimp that's been cooked. And most shrimp is cleaned and they, they pull that line out. But that line is the line that is showing like what they consume. It's, it's, it's kind of like a waistline. It's telling you what's in their in their bodies. The septic, their septic and, line. Again, God <laughs> made them. Yeah. <laughs> but God made them for that. God made them to be able to withstand the waste. That's what he purposed them for. But what we're doing is we're taking these animals. And like I said last week, we are impacting. We're, we're doing this. And it's, it's, it's very convicting to even think about it now. We are taking the, 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 the waste managers that were divinely created to, to manage and rid of the waste in the ocean, and we are consuming them in an all-time high. And makes you wonder, you know, they're, they're talking a lot about eco issues, and it's just like, 
perhaps if you think about it, I'm just thinking about this. Perhaps there's certain creatures that are even in our rivers, that are even in our fresh water, um, fresh water environments that are actually created for that purpose to clean, to keep those that water clean because they were created purposely to manage and part and 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 to consume the waste so that the water stays fresh. And so now there's a lot of talk about fresh water issues, you know, even the ocean, you know, but it's amazing how God divinely created these animals for that purpose. And even though we can think there's nothing wrong with consuming crabs and consuming um, uh, a shrimp and all that, we are actually partaking in the, the destruction of, in a sense, these creatures that make up the ecosystem that we all need to survive. So um, I just wanted to share that in regards to the sea creatures to just kind of elaborate on that. And I'm gonna give you, uh, sister, I didn't know if there was anything that you wanted to add to that um, in regards to what I was just saying. Um, just to add some, uh, with regards to the sea creatures, uh, did some research. I wanted to just give us a heads up on what was, um, what was clean and what was unclean. So it made jog some of our members to be like, oops, can't eat that. And I also wanted to point something out about a very famous, um, well-known, um, uh, seafood okay so for clean clean uh clean fish salt and fresh water we're looking at the alewife anchovy barracuda bass black pomfret blue fish blue gill branzino carp you can eat cod you can eat cobia crappy drum flounder grouper grunt Haddock, hake, halibut, hardhead, herring, king mackerel, uh, king croaker, king fish, mahi mahi, marlin, minnow, mullet, narrow barred Spanish mackerel, opa, perch or bream, pike, or what they call pickerel or jack. Pollock or Boston bluefish, uh, rockfish, and uh, let's see, sardine, shad, sheep, sheep's head, silver hake, or what they call whiting, smelt, frostfish or icefish, snapper or ibu, jobfish, lehi, onaga, opa, cap. Paka, oh, uku, that's another name for snapper. Sole, steelhead, sucker, sunfish, tarpon, tilapia, trout, weak fish, tuna or ahi, aku, abokor, bonito or tombo. Then they say turbot, but you can't eat the European turbot. You can eat the wahoo, white croaker, white fish, whiting, and the yellowtail amberjack. Now, I skipped one intentionally, and that is the salmon. Salmon is very famous for a lot of us. We like our salmons, fresh water, salt water. Um, something that I found out, okay, um, in the wild, in the salt water fish, salmons feed on life, okay? So they eat what is living. They feed on natural food in their environments like live algae, smaller fish, plankton, and other natural growing in the ocean. Now, there's another kind of salmon which a lot of people are eating, okay? And that's the farm-raised salmon. One of the things we have to note is that farm-raised salmon live in pens. They, so they're gathered in these submerged pens and they're given what's already dead, okay? Ground fish, fish waste, and they also given GMO, corn, and soy. Why? Helps them to grow larger, faster, 
and yield more fish. So these, so um, also they give in uh, supplements and supplements that are made from petrochemicals. So <laughs> I'm telling you, petrochemicals are chemicals derived from hydrocarbons such as propane, ethane, butane. We're talking about gasoline or other components separated from crude oil and natural gas liquids. OK, so petrochemical comes in for uh, uh, what they call syn syn synthetic materials, which is uh, like plastics. Uh, and also they use syn synthetic materials for medicines and cosmetics, also for furnitures, electronics, stuff like that. Um, synthetic materials such as ethylene that they use in paper, propylene in paints, benzene for pharmaceuticals, methanol for insulation, building construction, and tooling. Now, one of the, the petrochemical that I'm talking about that they give and they feed to these animals is called astaxanthin. Now, astaxanthin is a pigment. It's a synthetic pigment, okay, that belongs to the group of chemicals called carotenoids, okay? Now, carotenoids is found naturally in certain algae, okay, and causes the wild-caught salmon to have that pink-red color. What does that astaxanthin do? It gives it the, the farm-raised fish because it is not um, farm raised ocean. It is farm raised fresh water in a what they call those pens. So when they give them that petrochemical, it now turns their color red. And you're thinking, oh, it's salmon. No, it has been an induced dye. Okay. This is no different than when they wash old meat. Okay. And, and plump it up. They use that, 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 um, like bleach to bleach the the old meat and give it that nice color back and then they sell it back to you it's the same thing okay i was i was taken back by this because uh you know when you when you look in the 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 uh the fishers market in the store you see the wild caught salmon and it's like twenty dollars a pound and then you see the farm rays which is in you know, plenty supply, and you'll be seeing okay by two um two pounds for for you know twelve dollars because they have it always on a special. We need to be very careful of what we eat. Okay, um, the, some list for your uh, unclean fish. If you eat anything like this, eel, catfish, bullhead, bassa. The European turbot or the um, the mackerel, uh, not the mackerel that I stated before. Um, paddlefish, shark, stickleback, sturgeon, okay, swai, or even the the swordfish. Swordfish, you remember the one with the long swords? Okay, for the shellfish group, looking at abalone, clam, the conch, the crab, the crayfish, or what they call crawfish. Krill, okay, lobster, mussel, oyster, scallop, and of course, the shrimp, what they also call prawn. As my sister says, these shellfishes are the garbage dump of the ocean, okay? They dwell at the bottoms, and we are too much going at, let's say, we are crying out climate climate change. We're crying out about our ecosystem, and yet still, we're eating our ecosystem, okay? Um, there is a, there's an article that was done in Natural Living Family, and it points out uh, the, that the shellfish have such a high toxic load, okay? They eat not just, um, you know, what's at the bottom, but they also eat any dead animal remains that's along the bottom of the, the, of the ocean, the, the ocean's uh, bottom floor. So they eat any, including dead, that is. So, you know, why eat something that is 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 like a cannibal and it doesn't care, it's just, it's food for it. It's a carnivore, okay? And so... Um, and they also state that in the um, 
uh, for like shrimps and stuff, it says they contain a lot of parasite. And they said that, you know, we could say, okay, one particular shrimp is more full of parasites, but they say they all do. Okay. Um, for soft body, unclean uh, sea creatures, we're looking at cuttlefish, jellyfish, and people eat this stuff, limpet, octopus, and they eat the squid, calamari. Oh, on a Friday night, oh, people going out there, fried calamaris, and they want their beer. It's Friday night, okay? Sea animals, not to eat dolphin. Dolphin don't have scale. Has a fin, no scale. The otter, nope. The porpoise, the seal, the walrus, or even the whale. But we do. They all have a purpose. Now, if I if I if I have something that serves a purpose, and now I removed it from its purpose, how can I, um, you know, complain about that I no longer have that use when I've deprived myself of it? Hmm? Amen. <laughs> Sister Jen. I think she's trying to. So I I will um, sister Carolina, you're asking for the list of the foods. I will. Um, yes, please. Okay, I will uh, put that. Actually, I will put it on our um, in the YouTube, and then because it's gonna have, I'm I'm gonna put in there the clean birds, unclean birds, and all that too. Okay. All right, Sister Jen. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, dear. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm still going to be on uh, live, but I just called in as well, so uh, I just have my um, I have my computer muted, but you'll still probably be able to see me. But um, you just dropped off your your live fell out, so it's just yeah. you're only connected to phone now. Okay. It, it keeps loading back up. I'm, but, um, okay, but I'm here. So, oh, okay. there I am. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, so you're going to put in the chat for sister, um, the, uh, the clean and the unclean. Yes. I'll put it out on the YouTube and also I'll stick it out there on Facebook also. So that we'll have it. Okay. Awesome. Well, we hate to, we hate to, uh, you know, kind of be bare of bad news when it comes to people, you know, people like what they like, um, you know, and especially being down in Florida, we're close to the ocean. So, you know, we have our, you know, we have these, uh, these cravings and these uh, uh, appetites you know, true. that we have, you know, we have cultivated um, you know, and we, we've cultivated it in a sense culturally, because again, we're near the ocean. So, um, you know, people know how to make it taste good too, but you know, it's, it's just something that, you know, we're not trying to tell people that you have to go cold Turkey per se, but we're just trying to let you know that, you know, there, there's a reason why God has created things, even when it comes to, um, you know, I mean, honestly, let's just think about it, sis, like he didn't even have to you know, give us the, the, the ability or the right to partake of meat, you know, he could have just said, no, just stick with the seed bearing uh, plants and stuff like that. But, you know, he, he gave us the, you know, the permission to partake of, you know, of certain animals and mm -hmm. stuff like that as food. And so my thing is, is that I think when we are growing in our relationship with the Lord, um, as we grow a deeper relationship with the Lord and as we grow a relationship with him to the point where we want to know his heart, we, we go back to, you know, this, you know, where in a sense, his heart started, his heart started with his people, Israel. And there were things that he established with his people that was in his heart um, because he wanted them to be distinguished. He wanted, and, and not only did he want them to be distinguished, he wanted other people to see that what distinguished them, what distinguished them was something that perhaps would be attractive to them and ultimately 
you know, bring those people in as well. Um, so, but everything he does is for our good. So let's see it, you know, going forward in a sense, no, it's not about, well, I'm just not doing crab anymore just because God says so, but it's because I know that if he's telling me not to eat it, perhaps it is for my good, you know? So we praise God for that. So we're going to move on to the, um, if you don't have anything else, we're going to move on to the birds. And um, I am going to, I don't know if Sister Carolina, you can read about the birds, not the movie. We're not talking about the movie. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if so, we're going to go from verse 13 to verse 19 of Leviticus 11. And if you are able to read that, Sister Carolina, I would love for you to read that. Otherwise, um, I can, I can read it and then. I'll let Sister Lena read about the flying insects. Can you do that, Sister Carolina? Yes, Sister. Okay, whenever you're ready. Leviticus 13. These are the birds you are to detest and not eat because they are detestable. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, any kind of black kite, any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, any kind of heron, the hoopoe, and the bat. All flying insects that walk on all fours. Do I keep reading? Um, you can go ahead. You can go ahead and finish to verse 23. That's fine. Okay. Are to be detestable to you. There are, however, some winged creatures that walk on all fours that you may eat. Those that have jointed legs for hopping on the ground. Of these, you may eat any kind of locust, caddy did, cricket, or grasshopper. But all other winged creatures that have four legs, you are to detest. You will make yourselves unclean by these. Whoever touches their carcasses will be unclean till evening. Amen. Thank you, sister. Um, there's that, that word again, un uh, detest. Again, um, it speaks of, you know, being unclean. It speaks of disgusting, filthy. And so, Sister, I know there were some things, Sister Lena, that you had mentioned to me about the four legs, the four legged insects, and I would love for you to elaborate on that. Um, I want to elaborate a little bit on the birds, um, you know, the specific birds that um, were deemed as clean and unclean. And so, for for most for most of us that at least are in this country, um, most of us when it comes to winged um, like flying birds or winged animals, there's primarily, most of us primarily would say that we eat chicken. You know, that that's probably the winged animal that we would say that most of us eat. Um, most of us say, would say every once in a while, you may have duck, you know, you may have duck. Um, uh, turkey is another one most people would say that they have at, have had turkey. Most people don't eat turkey on an everyday basis, but they would say that they've had turkey. Now, the, the, um, the birds that were called out in this, though, were the eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, um, the red kite, the black kite, any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, uh, the stork, any kind of hair on the hoopy and the bat. So now most of that scripture referenced owls and most of us will say that these birds were, are not birds and not even animals or creatures that we would eat. And I'm sure for many of us, it is because of the nature of the animal. So, for instance, for instance, vultures, we know that anytime you see a dead animal on the road, 
you already know who's showing up. You already know which church choir. So, oh yes, showing up for that thing. You already know that when you, you know, me and my sister, me and my sisters make a joke because every time we see the whole group of these vultures, we said, "Oh Lord, here come the here come the church choir." The choir, right? The church, they're getting ready to break bread somewhere, and it's it, but. To be honest, if you know, all jokes aside, we automatically know that when we see vultures, that they are they're they're gathering because they are drawn to dead to dead carcasses. True. And it's interesting because in the end times, it talks in in Revelation. It mentions about the it mentions the the flesh of man that there is a there's a war and that there's so much flesh from men and all the birds will gather to eat the flesh of kings and i'm not saying that this is what it is but but perhaps those birds will be vultures or flying birds that feast off dead flesh because that's what they do so here we are again. We have waste management. We have the 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 waste management airline. <laughs> I call them the waste management airline. And who in their right mind would kill and eat this type of creature that I'm feeds off dead carcasses? What's actually going now on? we we wouldn't do that. We would not do that with the vulture. But we do that with the crab, but we do that with the shrimp, but we do that with the pig. The vulture is the same thing, but we would never eat a vulture because we see the vulture in action. We don't see the crab in action. We don't see the shrimp in action. We don't see the pig in action. We might see the pig in action, but we really don't see them in action as much as we do the vulture because you automatically know when you see a vulture that there that there's a carcass somewhere primarily an animal um but the, the so because of the nature of that that animal that is that's not a, that is not a bird that we would eat but so here we are the scripture says don't even eat this bird well we can we can definitely you know can you know attest to that you know what i'm saying we can attest well we wouldn't eat the vulture but then there's other animals that it mentions, the eagle. Now, I don't know how it is in other countries, but I know in this country, the eagle would never be even regarded as a source of, of meat. Um, I don't even, for the, for the sake of the distinction of clean and unclean, clean meaning you can eat this, unclean meaning you can't, we wouldn't even regard the eagle as clean for the for the purpose of eating because the eagle is like the state but it's, it's the bird of this country it represents our our nation's flag so for us it would kind of be like in a sense we could use the word you would you know detestable to partake of an eagle that represents you know your nation you know what i'm saying it, it represents it's a symbolism of your nation um so in that case, uh, I can see why we would not, you know, we would not do that. But eagles also, you know, these are these type of birds, they're predator, they're <laughs> predator animals. So they feed off of, you know, they, they're always looking, they look for their prey. Um, I know that, that um, you know, uh, the ravens, the owls, the hawks, they all feed off of smaller animals. Like they'll pick them up and just eat them live. You know, like they'll, they'll pick up rabbits, you know, any type of small, you know, animal. The, the, I've, I've seen them eat snakes. They'll eat snakes. And so, you know, but these types of birds, you know, we, we would not eat them. So, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how they're also deemed as unclean anyway, but we see them more in, in their, I guess, 
we see them more fulfilling their purpose because we can see them in action often, you know, when we're driving our cars, when we're out, you know, in, you know, taking a walk, you know, with our dogs or whatever. So we see them in action. So because of that, being able to see what type of creatures they are, we would never partake of them. You know what I mean? Now, what's interesting, though, I want to bring up about the bats. I not fan bats. I haven't seen bats so in many years. I, I have when I lived up north, we had we had bat problems in our like we had a chimney. So bats tend to climb down into the chimney and, and you know, make homes there. So we had, you know, one or every once in a while, like every few years, we would have a little little friend Pickaboo come out and <laughs> and surprise us. But What's interesting about bats is that bats are are the type of, they are very hideous looking birds. They're, They're hideous looking creatures. But what's interesting about them is just, just kind of like the pig, bats can carry, um, I don't want to say they're, they're, they carry diseases. But they are, they have the ability to, how do you say, sister, like withstand, they're, they, they're created to withstand certain things, including diseases. And yes. so, so what's interesting about the bat, though, is that the bat feeds off of insects like mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are known they're, they are insects that are known to carry diseases because they, they, you know, they suck the blood from humans and they pass it on. And they are known to be like insects that, that can cause diseases and stuff like that. We know this. And so here, here's this bat that feeds off of these mosquitoes. And I, it's, it's amazing. It's interesting. There was a, a rabbi that I, I, um, that I, um, whenever I come home, I go and listen to his teachings. And he said, you know, what's interesting is he said, people kind of give bats a bad, rap, a bad rap. They're, they're not attractive animals. But he said, but they actually help to reduce the spread of diseases because they consume the mosquitoes. And he said, so when diseases were going on, he said they help reduce a lot of the spread you know, because a lot of diseases have, have, you know, have been spread by, by insects, primarily mosquitoes. And, you know, we hear about it all the time, like ticks and all that. They said it was, might have been insects that, you know, that caused the spread of diseases that per, may have per se killed off the dinosaurs, you know. But when these bats consume these mosquitoes, they actually have the ability to withstand any of those diseases or infections or anything that is deadly to us. So again, I'm just showing you how, even though it's an unclean mammal, the significance of what they do, their significance to our ecosystem. And so it, it's, it's crazy how over the years we have seen an influx, we have seen a, a, a greater spread of diseases and i'm wondering if it perhaps is because i I don't see as many bats as i used to when i was growing up and i don't know if it's you know because they're dying off i don't know but i just want us to understand that again what is deemed as unclean still has great significance to the ecosystem and it's beautiful how god can distinguish it but it's it's still necessary to his creation. Um, Sister, I didn't know if you wanted to add to that. Um, Yes, actually, when I was thinking about the unclean birds, before I touch on the bat, um, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at, um, like, for instance, the eagle, the eagle's home is not, is, is usually in the highest heights, either in the top of the mountains, or it's in the highest top of the trees. So 
for for us to go and find that and to eat them it's it's like it's too much trouble and we're like you know we want what is easy and accessible to us so thank god for the eagle um you know eagles even though it's a, it's our national and protected um it also feeds on carrion as our sister says so um we may be admiring something but it feeds also on the dead. Yes, it'll come to earth and it will grab what it is, what it wants, but it eats mouse. It eats uh, unclean animals. It, it eats anything. It will even take your dog. Okay. Um, so, and looking at the owls, the owls are night predators and, you know, and they go after field mouse. They, they eat unclean so the lord is saying if it eats something unclean you don't want to eat it it's not clean right now with regards to the bat as our sister spoke about the bat eating the um the mosquito now think of this the bat is eating mosquito so if the bat is receiving all of these viruses and all of this um, bacteria and stuff, then you know that the droppings of the bat is not healthy either. Now, keep in mind that this virus that we're all dealing with in the pandemic, you know, is known, even though they're trying to dispute it, that it the origin of it, because um, the bats are known to carry the SARS, SARS viruses. It's the bat, a lot of of um, what's going, a lot of the viruses that we have come to experience, it's come from bats, you know, and bats, yes, they were made to, to, to become, how would you, how would you say it, walking virus machine, you know, and they consume everything else that's creating it, but its body is created to, to not be harmed by it. But what is happening is that we are messing with the ecosystem okay yeah. because if 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 the lord you know us caging bats first of all bats are not supposed to be caged it's supposed to be free roam doing what it's supposed to do and so then now we are as human coming in contact with the bat poop okay and somebody has to clean the bat cage right and so now now you have human to unclean contact you know, you have a wound goes in. Um, I, I just think if we just let things be, it would be much better for us. Um, but let me go ahead and give us some clean birds and unclean birds. Clean birds, we know the chicken, the dove, the duck, the goose, the grouse, guinea fowl, partridge, pea fowl. The pheasant, pigeon, prairie chicken, ptarmigan, the quail, we know about quail, sage hen, snipe, sparrow, and any other songbird, <laughs> swan, teal, and turkey is clean, guys. Turkey is clean. Now, unclean birds, we know they feed on the filth and the dead of the earth, the albatross, okay, bittern, buzzard. The condor, the coot, cormorant, crane, crow, cuckoo, eagle, flamingo, the grebe, gross beak, the gull, even gulls. Yes, if you see this, the seagulls, they're nasty. Hawk, the heron, the kite, lapwing, loon, magpie, osprey, ostrich, owl, pelican, penguin. Clover, rail, raven, roadrunner, sandpiper, seagull, stork, swallow, swift, vulture, water hen, and woodpecker. Now, who wants to eat a woodpecker? You know, we're looking at these things and it's disgusting, but how has the enemy sold it to us? Go into different countries. And they become delicacies, just like bat is a delicacy or the brain of a, a, a young, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, was it monkey, monkey brain? 
right? And old eggs, people are eating with feathers and all. It's, I, I have nothing more to say. We are slowly, you know, heading in the direction of, well, not slowly anymore. Let me take that back. In the direction of Noah, the times of Noah. So the Lord's going to have to cleanse the earth. But he said, no longer with water. Yep. Yep. Let's remember that. You know, you know, sister, I actually read, um, uh, I, I read from an um, article that in, in some countries, they actually eat that. There are countries far away from here, but they actually eat bats. And I, I don't, I can't understand, you know, con again, considering the function, considering the purpose of the bat and its diet, how people could partake of it as a, as a source of food. Um, I mean, if you even think about the vampire bats, you know, the vampire bats, they love to feast off of blood, especially cattle. Uh, the blood of cattle, and they can smell the blood, you know, and so, I mean, and, and of course, this is where we get our, our, you know, our vampire movies and stuff like that, based on the vampire bat, that it loves, and it, it loves to feast off of, you know, fresh blood, and again, if you just think about that, and, and you just, can you imagine partaking of an animal that feasts off the blood of other animals. I mean, at some point, I would mm -hmm. think that this this desire would begin to uh, surface or something in regards to wanting blood, and it's yes. happening, sister. You know, people. You know, I I know people. Just when you talked about the octopus and stuff, I'm like, I you know, there's ink that comes out of an octopus. Like, I don't like anything that has scales in it. Like, I don't think anything that has like suction. I call them suction cups. I said if this animal out of the sea can take their whatever leg or something and they can stick they can put it on a wall and it can stick i said i'm not supposed to be eating it <laughs> you know they um, sold it to us though they sold it to us because they tell us okay well, if you eat the if you eat the conch if you eat the octopus uh, it, it gives a man what they call stamina so the man now goes and he goes and get the kunk and he makes a soup with it. And it, it does, it, it's, yeah. you know, all these things that we are what we eat, right? right. So whatever they eat, we also are, okay? We know mm -hmm. in spiritual warfare that when you sleep with one man, you're sleeping with the man and all the women that he has slept with. And vice versa, man sleeping with the woman, you're sleeping with the woman and all the women that, you know, and all the men that she ever slept with, right? So there is that, that, that dragnet that you're caught up in. So whatever the animal at, you're also consuming in your body. You may not open your mouth right. and receive it, you know? So, so here we are, we are we are consuming these things. And I think that that's why it does something to the body. And it, yeah. there may be, you know, something that you feel super strong for a few, but constant um, ingestion of that diet will do something to your body. And I think that's why people have some, uh, we deal with heart attacks, you know, people that consume a lot of shellfish, there's a lot of poison in their blood. Um, you know, uh, people have, um, you know, high blood pressure from uh, eating uh, shellfish also. Uh, you know, we deal with a lot of clogged arteries from the food that we're consuming, and we deal with a lot of colds. We deal with a lot of um, uh, nasal, uh, um, you know, infections and recurrence of viruses, recurrence of bacterial infections, and we can never seem to get a cure. And that's all boils down to our diet. Now, with our diet, we get very good and creative of weeding out like um, what they call um, not eating uh, um, 
what do you call it? Um, ah, the flower, right? We can weed such things out. But when it comes to what we call protein, in quotes, we have a hard time with that because we're now going into that place where we don't want to let go off. How dare you come and tell me that eating shrimp is going to make me sick? I've been doing well. Okay. All right. So you've been doing so well, but you also have issues. Have you tried to strip out the shrimp, you know, like do a process elimination to get down to what's really wrong with you? And normally when we go to the doctor and we fill out our medical history, last thing we're talking about is what our diet really is. We can tell them all the pills that we're popping and why are we yeah. popping those pills because of our diet. Why is our, why are we having a, a, a heart and uh, lung diseases and, uh, you know, intestinal diseases because everything is all backed up. We're poisoned. We're, I mean, we're, we're literally consuming poop and we think it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and, and it's true, SARS-CoV that we are dealing with right now, that COVID-19, they're trying to hide it. It came from bat. At the base of it is a bat. Okay. And they did some stuff with the, they got the bat blood and bat poop, and they've been messing with some things. And so here we are. You have um, uh, animal to human transference. You know, the same thing they did with uh HIV. Yes, I'm going to go there too. Okay. There's a lot yeah. of stuff that's been in, that's been uh, introduced into human population. It started with animal, you know, I, that's why I say to people, if you own a dog, do not stick your tongue inside of the dog's mouth. It's got a whole lot of bacteria. When you stick your tongue in the dog's mouth, you're going to get what they call thrush. OK, and from thrush, then you're going to pass it to your children through your kissing. And then we have introduction of animal bacteria into human. And we have this whole mess. And so we have our intestines all jacked up. Why? We need to understand that we are the higher order. They are the lower order. Let them be the scavengers. We don't eat them. God already provided for us. Amen. So, sister, you you have the the insects now, right? You do the insects. Yeah, I yeah, okay. I actually um, I wanted you to elaborate on that because honestly, oh. God would God didn't. <laughs> I'm just saying, like God don't have to tell me what's clean or unclean. To me, it's all unclean. I ain't eating no insects. <laughs> But but again, yeah. you know, we have to remember culture was was different. You know, there there were probably and and the other mm -hmm. thing we also have to remember since we're talking about the insects is that again, man has <laughs> man has has manipulated the ecosystem so much since this time. You have so many bugs. Um Yes, we have you, created our own. Yeah, you have so many bugs now that are experiments from laboratories at universities or whatever. And it's just man being curious to see, what if I mix this with this? We do it. We do it with animals. We breed animals that should not be bred, you know, especially, and we do it for the sake of the dollar, you know, like we're, we're not breeding, we're not breeding mix of species per se, but like, for instance, oh, I want this dog mixed with something else. So you breed the dog with another, you know, dog that, come, that is a different type of dog and you breed them and you make this whole new breed. So you're, what's happening is, in, in, in a sense, it's so symbolic in a sense, we're losing what I call a pure breed. We're losing that pure breed that, and, and 
we there was way more pure breed back in these biblical times than there is now. Everything's so mixed. And in a sense, that is ultimately what Satan wants to do with us. He wants us to mix what who we are, what we do, what we say, even what we eat, our lifestyle. He just does he just wants us to mix it with a little bit of this nation with a little bit of that nation what is, because then what it does is it takes away us being a pure breed that is That's true what, that, that is what satan is ultimately trying to do um and he's been somewhat so, successful though uh, let us admit it because um humans are mating with animals and they have already started to cross breed meaning breed dog with cat so you have in different you have in uh different um life forms being you know they you know just like i don't know if you saw that um netflix with that uh human um with the uh what was the animal that they did that cross switch and we we are sitting looking at it thinking that it's you know oh this is fiction no they they're doing experiments already where they want to yeah. mix the human dna with animal dna and they're creating different yeah. forms and um they're injecting humans with animal dna and so that's why we're seeing so much of this crazy stuff that's going on um ultimately is for it's it's another they're trying to duplicate the nephilim race okay yeah and um and to dilute the purity of god's creation yeah. to corrupt it mm -hmm. okay this is mm -hmm. what happened inside of the the garden and even our interaction with like serpents where you become the, known as the serpent man and you can have the sleep with the serpent and you know those are what they're trying to really create are symbiosis symbiosis is where the two um now uh feast off each other they become one we've seen these in horror movies where there is that yeah. fusion so uh they they're already practicing okay yeah. and they have enough dead bodies to be doing what they're doing but the thing is now they need to release it onto the live bodies and hence yeah hence. i'll tell you this sister i went to this zoo it's the zoo is in florida and i i when i first went um i was told that this zoo was created to um it, it, it was a zoo that rescued animals that were animals that were brought into domestic environments that should not be brought in, in domestic environments. They're wild animals being brought in domestic environments. And what happens is when they get to a certain maturity level, you know, they can't be in those environments anymore because they should be in the wild. And so these owners don't know what to do with them. So they, they, they take them to this you know the zoo and the zoo cares for them as if they're in their own habitat but technically but but they're they're in you know they're in cages mm -hmm. and um and i i know that the the uh how do you say their motive is their motive is right as far as they have to put them somewhere because otherwise these owners would have to put the animals down you know and it's unfortunate but while i was and i was really I, I really was impressed with the zoo, but the thing that kind of threw me off was when we were there, I saw this specific type of type of feline because um, there were tigers there. There was, there was a Siberian tiger there. There were lions, you know, I think there were some cougars there. Um, I didn't see a panther, but anyway, I saw this one feline and I looked at it, and, and I'm not going to, I kid you not, it looked just like the lion from the Chronicles of Narnia when the lion, how big that lion was, but he didn't have any hair. Like he, he remember when the lion's hair was shaved off and they, that's what this lion looked like. And I was like, that, is that a lion? I said, I've never seen a lion that big. I mean, it was huge. 
And what the person told me that worked there, she said, it's not, it's, it's a liger. I was like, what is lion that? She said, cheese. it's a crossbreed of a tiger and, and a, a lion. lion. And I said, why did you guys crossbreed a lion and a tiger? So these ligers have, because it's a creature that's not, it was, it's not, it was never created. It's a crossbreed. Its lifespan is 15 years. It has no, um, no personality no mm -mm. species that it identifies with. It can identify with the tiger because it's not full tiger and it can't identify with the lion because it's not full lion. So it's a loner species and it can only live for 15. It can only live for 15 years. And then you can't cross, you can't, it can't mate technically because it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a cross of two species. And I was just like, how, why would you do something like that to this? I felt bad for the creature. I felt so bad. And, but this, this liger was huge. And I'm thinking to myself, why, how could man do this? And, and, and what really hurt me more was they were, they ended up doing a show. I didn't know what the show was, but they were doing a show and they were basically teaching the animals tricks and the, the animals could get like a, a treat or something. And I said, see, no, this, this, this is, you're not saving these, you're, you're teaching them to do tricks and stuff. And it's just, I, I didn't like it. I, I lost a lot of respect for the place. Um, but, but the thing is, is that this is what man is doing. And again, he is, the more that we get on the subject about clean and unclean in regards to what we eat and what we can, we, what we shouldn't eat, consider the ecosystem. Let's consider the ecosystem. I mean, we are way beyond we have really like far gone, you know, and, and have really messed up the ecosystem at this point. I mean, it's still functioning, but we have, we've really done too much. You know, there's insects we've created that never existed before. I mean, mm -hmm. who knows what you see, you, you see a lot of different. With life. acidic. Like, yeah. Yes. Like, yes. Like, love bug, Florida. And it's just like, you what are you guys doing like what are you doing and so you know the thing is is that again even with insects you know like yes god deems he's there's certain things that have been deemed as clean and unclean honestly when it comes to the insects i, I deem them as all unclean because i won't eat them but again it's just like we we have to respect the purposes, the divine, they have divine purposes because they were divinely created. And we have to respect the purposes of these animals and these birds and these sea creatures and these insects, because if God made them, they have purpose. They serve a purpose in our ecosystem so that we are all in a sense in harmony with one another. And I've gotten to the point since I might be going far with this. But I've gotten to the point where even when it comes to certain, like, I'm not a big insect person, but when I see an insect in my house, I'm like, I try to save the insect and just get it outside versus quick to like, you know, like we're quick to smash the insect or whatever. But I mean, like I said, that might be a little bit, you know, for other people that might be a little bit, you know, outrageous, but I just. I've just grown a lot more considerate of life when it comes to even everything. And it's just like, Lord, I want to be respectful and mindful of more respectful and more mindful of everything that you created because of the fact that if you created it, you created it for a purpose. Just like how would we feel guys, if God created us for a purpose and here comes man and he does it. Here comes man, and he's like, you know what? Um, you know, Jennifer is human. I want to crossbreed her with. Um, I want to cross. I don't know. I want to crossbreed her with 
you know, a dolphin. You know, you're, you're taking the purpose away, not just from me, but from that dolphin for your own, for your own pleasure. And it's just, and, and that in a sense is an abomination. It's a filth. It's a filth to God, you know, cause it's just like, you're going against what I have created. You're going against that. And so sister, in a sense, you know, we have to repent of that. Even when it comes True. to our diets, we have to repent of that. True. We have to, you know? um, what I'm seeing here is that uh, we're not we're not satisfied. Man is not satisfied with the intelligent design uh, of what God has created, and so we're trying yeah. to to dibble dabble, and we say, "Oh, let's make more colors of this." Let's. I mean, we started to do it with plants, you know. Then we went to doing it with different breeds of animals, and as you can see, you know, the what we created, they came with different characteristics, aggressiveness. They are not the original creation, so they they themselves don't have no purpose. They are lost. They are lost. Lost um, animals, lost beings, for lack of a better word, that's in 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 a world that they don't belong. You know, they were just right. given given um, presence by man's dibble dabble, and so now they come. You know, just like some of these uh, lizards that they're doing, they eating up everything. I mean. The other day I saw this this lizard that came out of nowhere and went to eat this 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 bee. You know, um, mankind, we have, as, as I've spoken many times, we've become consumers. Look at even as we learned while we're doing Leviticus, the honey. The honey is made by the honey bee and it's supposed to be food for the honey bee. And who does it become food for? We now go in and we take out the entire honeycomb. We leave nothing back for the bee. So the bee is constantly enslaved trying to make honey to feed himself while we go and we rob, we rob the, 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 the honeycomb. You know, I, I just look at it and I said, God, God has to have mercy on us because we think we come in the name that we are trying to do good. You know, we're trying to um, help Right. And what we've done is that we've created of more of a mess. We've we've damaged more, uh, you know, and then when we do these inventions, we can't control. Look at all these these viruses. We've gone from one SARS CoV to how many now we're up to number 19. Right. And how many uh, of these bacteria and viruses and, you know, um, these viruses, actually, because bacteria, they they are short lived. Viruses are much more long lived. And there's very few that you can few things that you can do with a virus, like even the flu virus. They say, go sit home, let it run its course and, and its course running all the way through your body. And it come out of your nostrils, come out of your throat, come out of, you know, the anus is coming out of everywhere. That's viruses flowing through your body. We are creating these things, and they're jumping, and they they um, you know uh, cross they they cross um, jumping into different uh, uh, what do you call them um, genealogies? Lack of better word, uh, the word will come to me. So we become even more confused because while it is. Uh, cold over here when it jumps into human species different species thank you holy spirit jumps into another species then it morphs because it's not it's not the incubation is becomes different incubation means the time with, with uh, within the host of that body when it becomes known and in this presence where it's able to infiltrate into your bloodstream you know into the different organs right and and in, in a human, the mechanism, defense mechanism is different from the defense mechanism in an animal. And I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist. Okay, for anybody, let me be there. Let me just state it right now. It's just, I'm just speaking biology from what I learned in school. Okay, so, so now we have all these recreations. You know, we weren't content in just making graftings of 
fruits and different plant products. Now we have now grafting different species, bat species, with human species, with monkey species, with swine species. I mean, come on, you know, the, the swine species is now in the jello, right? And we've become so dependent on the swine species for lard and, and you know, for um, what they call it, uh, the viscosity for um they use it as a as a uh, coagulant in in a lot of uh, mixtures, even in medicines. The the yes, pork is in it. Okay, as a binding product. Th there's so much dependency, and you see, uh, it takes us back to why in the beginning. Right, even after the fall of man, where we were still confined, and I would say, and I would, and I'm going to use the word confine because what we did was we broke out of the confinement and decided that we needed to be set free. And now we've developed a taste for blood. What does that have led to? It has now led to humans consuming humans, not cannibalisms, as in cannibals from back in your history books. I am talking about 20th century century humans, doctors, lawyers, Indian and chiefs, okay, uh, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, okay, uh, black man, white man, uh, Hispanic man, doesn't matter who it is, woman or man or child, doesn't matter, right? They are now becoming flesh eaters, okay? eaters of flesh and drinkers of blood. They went from drinking chicken blood and eating chicken meat to now eating human meat and drinking human blood. And they say it makes them young. And they go after virgin blood, virgin flesh, young flesh, children. That is what we have created. We are turning into the same things, these Nephilims, and we're mating with demons, okay? We're mating. It's been happening before. This is something that I know of very well from our own testimony, okay? And so it's become even more pronounced now, okay? Incubus and Succubus have been around, but they're mainstream. You're seeing it on, on, on uh, music videos. You're seeing it on the movies. It is proliferated. It is widespread and acceptable. And now it's been introduced to more pedophilia. And we could go on and on and on. That's, we are what we eat. The characteristic of the animal that you consume, you become like them, okay? We know about the story of the, the, the Dharma um, family who ended up eating each other. They were stuck trying to make their way into the West and they were stuck in a, in a, in a snowstorm and no food, an entire family. And I think there was just one survival that came out of it, you know, it's in man to survive, and he will survive at any means necessary to save his own self, which will include even eating flesh. We see in scripture when this happened, but this didn't happen under good times. It was, it is, it was a practice that was condemned by our Lord. It's a thing detestable, a thing that's abominable. And what we're doing is the same abominable thing, and we're calling it good. And I think I've right. said my piece until we're ready for the, with the flying insects. It's, I mean, you could just now, continue on and on forever, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's amazing how the convert us having the conversation about diet would turn into a conversation about how it's affecting ecosystem and how ecosystem can affect our humanity, the the survival and the and the existence of our humanity. Like, and it and and it puts in perspective how it it put, it puts again it puts in perspective the harmony that we all should have with one another, including the harmony that we shouldn't just have with man, 
but the harmony that we should have with animals, the harmony we should have with, with, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the earth, the insects, the birds, the sea creatures, we should have harmony with all of them. And so even if we had harmony between man, if we can continue to consume uh, the way that we are with the animals, if we can, if we can continue to, um, not feel like we have to change our ways when it comes to what we eat and and what we deem as clean and what we deem as unclean, you know, and not think that what not think that our freedom is is not impacting the ecosystem and it's not impacting the um you know, the, the future state of our survival, we are, we are truly deceived. We really are deceived. And so deception in this sense is beyond just deception when it comes to the word of God, as far as our spiritual walk, it's deception in a lot of other areas of our daily life that we're not regarding as important, including our diet. And so this is really amazing sister it's it's really amazing and i would really encourage everybody listening to this including myself that again we're not saying your diet's going to change today we're not saying that you're going to do things cold turkey but if that is if if that's the, if if you have that strong of a conviction then hey but what we are saying is that over time after this 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 um this study on Leviticus 11, that there would be a a greater conviction that you'll have to the point where you will be a little bit more mindful. Mm -hmm. You will be a little bit more mindful of what you're eating. You'll be a little bit more mindful of what the process takes, the process that it is, is entailed in for you to partake of what you're eating. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like being a little bit more, more mindful of what you're putting in your body, being a little bit more mindful of, Amen. you know, all those things, because again, it impacts, it's going to impact all of us. We, even the animals that we're consuming, like, you know, I've gotten to a point where like, I'm really, I think now like, dang, like how did this piece of meat that I, you know, we eat once in a while, like, how did it get here? Like, what is the process that there that is is being taken to get this piece of flesh on my plate? Like, you know, there's some really um, how do they say? There's some really there's some serious atrocities going on, not even with people, but with animals. And we don't, you know, some deem they're they're there's no balance is what I'm saying. Like, you know, like we talked about last week, PETA, PETA or PETA, Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with, with standing for animal rights, but there's gotta be a balance. It's, Mm -hmm. there's gotta be a balance is what I'm saying. You you can't stand for human rights, but not stand for animal rights, but you can't stand for animal rights and not stand for human rights. So it's just a balance. And I, that's what God is requiring of us is is that balance so i'm praying that this is what you guys are getting tonight Um, i hope though that i'm sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say before you say that i just wanted to let you know i would love for you to get into the four-legged thing with the insect um and then i wanted to uh get back into the study try to definitely want to finish tonight but i wanted you to mention something about the the four-legged insect that you mentioned Uh, okay i think with the submission or something like that right okay okay i will um go ahead and finish yeah what i was gonna say is that um what we need is the fruit of the spirit of self-control yes we need to restrain ourselves the you know the amount and quantity of what we consume we don't need to um you know we don't need to consume as much. And I think that we need to like take a back stand and just really self do a self uh, 
you know, internal self-reflection, introspective reflection of your own yeah, self and say, okay, Lord, you know, this is where I, I am. This is, this is who I am now. What, based on what I eat, what am I like? You know, maybe some of your anger issues is because of the stuff that you're eating that 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 just cause it to flare up high salt content, frustrations, your fears, you know, uh, stuff. See, you, you have to we, we have to get to that place where we don't try to be God. You know, right. when God created right anything it created it with a purpose it had a design you know and right. we need to start trusting god with his design and not try to uh be one up on god to compete with god to say okay yes but my system can't like i hear people say all the time you know well my system can handle it you know bear that stuff is not healthy for our bodies OK, but we say right. our system can what is our system can not handle it. What happened was that this each drink numbed a portion, a part of your system to deaden mm -hmm. it so that you no longer have that reaction. OK, mm -hmm. uh, and it, so it gives you that that feel good. You're like feeling, oh, you know, I can I can drink, drink, a, you know, a bottle, a, a, a gallon of alcohol. No, what you have done is you've killed the cells, killed all of the, the firing that is firing off to say stop, 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 stop. So now you have now uh, totally just removed your your healing mechanism out of your body and, and numbed it. Right. We need to stop that and just allow the Lord to to do what he needs to do with us. We are God's people. And, you know, we're talking about the diet. It's hard. Yes. But, you know, when you are driven by the understanding to know that this is what Father Abba had instituted. OK, and you you want to please him. Just like your, your, your mother, you may love your, your, your friends, but because of your love for your mother, you say, you know what, I'm not going to stay out and, and, you know, push against the curfew that they've given me. I love my parents. So I'm going to come home. Why, why can't we treat God the same way with that respect? I think we need to. But anyway, let's um, let me share with us about with uh, the the. the uh, this was something that discovered with regards to um, the and the insects. Creepy. I call them the creepy crawlers. Creepy. <laughs> I don't like anything that creep or crawl. Uh, no, no creep, no crawl, no fly, no whatever. I don't like anything. And anything that comes into my house and I and I smell it, I I, I no, I, I don't want it. But anyway, um, in Leviticus eleven, uh, verse twenty one, it speaks of there are, however, some flying insects that walk on all fours that you may eat. Walk on all fours that you may eat. Right, says it walk on all fours. Then it says they have jointed legs for hopping on the ground. Right now, when you've done um, biology in school, you know that insects don't have four legs. Right, they all have six oh. legs. Right. And you know, they have three sections, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, and then the little sticky things like the cockroaches and all those crawly things out there. They have six legs. So I went and I did some digging, trying to figure out what does it mean by these flying insects, flying insects, okay, that walk on all fours. And by the way, a flying cockroach does not hop. OK, and it's not one of those. So, all you know, people that are out there eating the flying Madagascar cockroaches, you don't eat something unclean. <laughs> ah, just thinking about it makes me want to puke. But anyway, 
when I looked up the, um, started to do some Hebrew roots on it, right? And mm -hmm. the Bible was, was speaking to us about flying insects as in it was speaking towards swarming insects. We know swarming insects like the grasshopper, the locust, which the grasshopper is a form of the locust. They are swarmers, okay? You always see them in plenty. They alight together and then take off together and then you have nothing left, right? So, so, um, so uh, the Hebrew word, which is nata, 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 N-A-W-T-H-A-R, which means to jump. Right, it speaks of bugs in their swarming. They come and then they leap. We know flies swarm, but they don't leap. Okay, all right. So the four now becomes a problem. Where does the four come from? The four comes from the form. When you go down on all fours, they say get down on all fours. I'm human right? I only have two hands and two legs. But when I get down on all fours like this, you know, when I'm down on the ground, I form a four, four corner. So they on fours, what they mean is the form, the square. Okay, I think my um, peer, okay, it's back. My, I had a little problem there with my microphone. I'm in. So now I'm in this four, and in this four is a place of submission for me as a human. And the word for that place of submission of that square is called a raba, R A W B A H. That's Strong's H7250. That means to go down on the hands and the knees. It's a form of prostration, it's a form of humility. Now, when I started to look at this, I was like, the Lord, He's very. Um, you know, that's why we, we need to leave the creativity to the Lord. We need to leave designs to the Lord, right? Because when he was speaking about the locust, okay, uh, even the locust that came into Egypt and consumed everything, right? He is speaking about us from a spiritual standpoint, us humans uh, in a surrendered pose a, a, as, as a, a, a uh, stance of worship, as it says, to shaha, to be bowed over, to be down on all fours. We don't have any fours, right? To be down on. We don't leap also from this position. We are now in a surrender. But when the Spirit of the Lord alights on us, there is a leaping where we are now made straight standing, standing in the perfection of the one, hallelujah, the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. So we come from this place of being bowed, of being surrendered to now being usable, acceptable by the Lord. And so when, the, when the, the Lord was showing to us about with some certain flying insects. And remember, when we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we now feel like we can fly, right? As it says in Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew, right? They shall mount up with wings, mount. Now you can mount up with wings like the eagle. They shall walk and not be faint. They shall, they shall run and not be weary. Now you've been added onto. Now you can leap with joy. You have strength that you never had before. You're now able to do that which you never able to do. But the beginning of that place of being able to do is a place of four square and that's being bowed down and then 
I started to think about when um, even uh, when Ezekiel at the river Chabar, when he had a glimpse of heaven open up and he saw the cherubims, they had they had the uh, six six hands, right? Yeah. And said so had two over two over their two over their eyes. Um, two. Let me go there. River Chabar, Ezekiel one, and then they had they had uh, two. Two, two over their feet, one second. Sometimes you have to go back in and look. Okay, each of them. Okay, I'm sorry. Four faces and four wings. Forgive me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So Ezekiel chapter one, verse six, it says, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. And then it speaks about verse eight, under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings. And the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved and so uh let me see if i can find the place where they covered okay verse 11 ezekiel 1 such were their faces they each had two wings spreading outward each wing touching that of the creature on either side and each had two other wings cover its body so it's the fours and if you look at biblical numerology the number four is the number of creation Okay, and right. God created the heaven and the earth, right? So now the Lord is saying, the, the, uh, These people have I formed for my okay, these people have I formed. This is scripture to show forth my praise. These people have I formed for myself, these people have I created for myself, these people have I. I've given my breath for myself so that they will be able to shaha with me. They will be able to have worship with me. They will be a, a, a prostrated uh, people before me. So we are represented in this case. In this case, we are represented as the locust. I'm trying to see if I can find this. Okay, Isaiah 43, 21. The people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. The NIV version of it said, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Church, when we look at scripture, we... There is a ceiling when we come to Christ, and that's a ceiling by the Holy Spirit. Okay, the you know um, the first gift to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and He starts to live. It brings conviction, and then you know we receive the power, the fire of the Holy uh, of the fire of the Holy Spirit, fire of the Holy Ghost. Um, so none of us should be without that conscience right now if you are a man or woman a child a uh, son or daughter of the most high god right now you have the holy spirit on the inside which is the ceiling of you and so by the ceiling you should understand that his job is to bring to us truth and there is no way that we are supposed to accept the meat and drink from another's cup when we have the meat of the word, the truth of the word. And we have, even in scripture, the semblance, the resemblance of what God, what God is representing to say to us, you are my people. A swarm, a swarm is a gathering, a grouping, and they all function together. When a local swarms, yeah. they come and they attack the very same uh, plant or whatever it is and then they all consume and then they alight off this is how we are supposed to be a swarm against the kingdom of darkness we're supposed to swarm with light if you ever seen uh what we call um we call them peeny wallies back home i don't know what they call them uh the little uh insects with the with the light they look like headlights when you when you put them together oh, we call them uh 
Yeah, we call them. Um, what do you uh, call them? I know what you're talking about. Light bugs? I know what you're talking about. Lightning Is that light bugs? Something. Lightning, okay. Lightning, or, we call them lightning bugs. Lightning okay. Bugs. Mm -hmm. So when you put so many of them in a jar, you literally have like your own, uh, you know, flashlight basically yeah. this is what we are supposed to be we we need to get to that place of all fours we need to be square to the ground okay we need to be on our hands and on our feet on our hands and our knees sorry hands and our knees so to be on your knee that those feet has to be bowed down and be at the same perpendicular to the earth, okay? The earth resting our knees on the earth, bow down to say, we are now brought low because we are before the presence of one who is greater. We understand that he is creator and that we are his created. We are now creation before the creator God. Bow down to say, we are in a place of gratitude thankfulness we are in a place of submission we're in a place of humility we're in a place of surrender and in, we are waiting for him to stretch out his staff to say rise up that rising up the holy spirit within begins to stir within us and we now be set on fire and we now want to leap with joy when we live with joy we now you know we are now becoming the microphone of god to proclaim his name in the earth and we leap from 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 building to job to to church to wherever to the community to the street to nations to tell them and what we bring in is that we bring in light light to consume darkness we bring in truth to destroy lies right to tear down the demonic stronghold generational strongholds and to now set people free amen Amen. And mm -hmm. in other nations, yes, they love locusts. Okay. They have curry locusts. And I was looking, I was like, what? Curry locusts? Yes. They got curry How locusts. Say, yes. And they <laughs> got barbecue locusts. Yes. And, oh. it, it, but you know, the funny thing is that they take the wings off and then for some they leave the head and the abdomen some they take mm -hmm. depending on the tradition um they take off the wings and the legs and uh another tradition i think they take their head off and they just leave the wings and the rest of it and i'm sitting going like um can i get this that hungry enough that i would do that i don't know and i came to find out that they they eat it in uganda but i was like what and i didn't eat uh locust when i was there i didn't even know it was a delicacy there so i'm thinking i don't know but are you they, are you sure you did it are you sure they didn't feed you something and you didn't know if it was <laughs> Believe me, no, 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 no. You would think when you see this locust on the plate, you would think you're eating um, beef stir fry. Oh, which reminds me something I wanted to mention with regards to food. Yeah. You may think you're getting chicken. They also mm -hmm. are giving substitute meat. Mm -hmm. Okay they give you substitute they were killing dogs to give chicken as a matter of fact it was this year in orlando where someone bought um uh like uh it was at a chinese restaurant chicken yeah. and they gave them uh what was it and how did they find out and then uh what was it? They were given, it was actually pork. They were given pork. Yes. Okay. Now I remember they were given pork and the, the restaurant owner tried to keep them quiet about it and said, they'll give them a free meal. See, 
when you start to indulge in flesh, then deception is not too far behind because now you're trying to to meet the demand that tastes for blood. And so it has mm-hmm. now now uh, spring forth an industry where people are in deceptive practices, selling you old meat for fresh meat. They sprinkle old fish for fresh fish, you know, so you never know what you're going to get. That's very true. That's very true. They have done that a couple of times at the supermarket. They, if meat doesn't sell, They'll remix it with the fresh meat, like the old meat. They'll re- they'll they'll remix it with a fresh meat, and they'll resell it. They'll repackage it and resell it. And it's so. okay because it's within a certain window, and they put coloring on there, and it's okay until the FDA happens to walk in one day and say, "Wait, this is this is beyond the standard expected." Now, why would you have old meat? that it's okay for me to receive that meat when it's three weeks old. And that same meat has been killed weeks before that. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Again, we're not trying to have anybody go cold turkey here, but we're just Putting some things in perspective, um, you know, just definitely some things to think about. Um, uh, sister had a question. Um, is it okay? Yeah, I, I had a question. I don't yeah. mean to sound gross or anything, but, you know, <clears throat> my father, <clears throat> as a little infant, uh, you know, he raised me eating uh, the insides of animals, say, like, you know, the eyeballs of goats or intestines or you know uh and things like liver uh you know go go eye taquitos and stuff like that is that okay if it comes from a clean animal well um like is every part of that animal okay to eat as long as it's from you know what are the clean animals that the lord says we can eat from Go back to Leviticus uh, when the Lord spoke about with the burnt offering and a certain parts yeah. of the intestines yeah. that were eaten and the rest of it was burnt outside the camp for the sin offering. And on the burnt offering, everything was burnt. But re- remember, the priest only got to eat from the sin <laughs> offering and the free will offering. So I think that was in Leviticus. Hold on. Uh, oh, here it is. I believe it was eight. It was, it was seven or eight. Uh, no, um, in, in the beginning, uh, number two, Leviticus two. While you while you get that, I just want to say too. I, I think it's there too, sister. That in eight, yes, you're were, right. There were specific. There were specific um, uh, parts of the animal that were eaten. Like I think that the it was the breast and the thigh, mm-hmm. and those were part of the wave offerings, and those mm-hmm. were given to the priest. Um, so. And it's kind of what we do now. Like, you know, when we, when we have chicken, we eat like the breast, the thigh and stuff like that. Um, now, in regards to the intestines, I personally, I wouldn't say it doesn't, I wouldn't say in here, I mean, this is going to read it, but it's not to say that it is in, or isn't in there to not eat intestines. But if you think about it, what is the purpose of the intestines? And I don't. I mean, yeah, like the intestine, I, people, uh, you know, I haven't eaten intestine in years because yeah. the, I know that's, you know, it grossed me out, you know, once I was saved and everything. Yeah. And then the thought hit, you'd be like, they pooped through that, you know? What I mean? Okay. Well, and well, so it grosses you out, though, you know? But, but people do that though. Like, so for instance, like chitlins, that is taking yes. intestines and like, mm-hmm. I've never had them, never, okay. ever had them. What so, about liver, ahead, sisters? What about liver? Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there right now. Okay. In Leviticus chapter 3, 
where he talks about the sin offering, okay, the fellowship offering, right? So the fellowship offering, it says here in Leviticus chapter 3, verse, yeah, 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 I just, just passed it again. Okay, from the fellowship offering, it said, okay, the, oh, hold on, hold on. You, you, you don't get to eat that part. Those parts are burnt. Hold on. I just looked at it. Just looked at it and slipped my mind. Hold on. Keep, 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 keep talking. Keep talking. Okay. All right. So here now, uh, Levit Leviticus chapter three. All right. It says, if it's a, a lamb from the flock or goat or whatever. Okay. So. It says, from the fellowship offering, verse 9, you are to bring a food offering to the Lord. It's fat. The entire fat tail cut off close to the backbone. People love to eat the tail of the animal. It says, the internal organs and all the fat that is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver, which you will remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. You're silent. So that's a no-no. If, if it's the goat, <laughs> if it's the goat, it says the internal organs and all the fat that is connected to them. It says both the kidneys with the fat near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which you'll remove with the kidneys. They are to be burnt. Okay. So and does it that was, also count for, uh, say, like goat uh, eyeballs? Is that also count for Well, listen, organs? listen, this is from the fellow. This is, this is, it says the, it's, what I just told you was burnt on it, right? So let's look at, was it Leviticus 8 with the priest portion? Um, Sister Jen, right? Leviticus 8 with the priest portion. Just give me one second yeah. here. Let's answer that. Because it's with the priest portion in Leviticus 8. Okay. So Leviticus 8, the priest portion, they only got like, okay. Moses brought, put the blood, thumbs, okay, sin offering. From the, mm, okay, so all that what I'm saying with the intestine is burned on the altar. And then Moses took the breast and rave it and that was moses portion so there is no intestine that is and so all the skin and everything else is burnt outside the camp so some of these things that we're eating eyeballs and the intestines we're not called to eat because remember the intestine is a is the septic system it's the um the garbage disposal, so it's retained. It's it's retained a lot of lot of the uh, processing of the food, the bacteria, and all of that. So what we have done is that we now wash it, and now we're going to go eat the meat which has processed all of that bacteria, and now we're putting it back into our system. So now it is twice refined. And you know, when you refine something, it becomes even more potent. So Leviticus 3, Leviticus 8, guys, study it for yourselves. You look to see, um, look at the one with the sin, with the sin offering. It's the, the skin and the rest of everything else is burned outside the camp. There's a, there's a pile for that. And I would just also reiterate, let's remember the purpose of a specific function, not just with the animals, but even with our, like, how God created us. So everything is divinely created for, for a specific purpose and function, including our intestinal, you know, our intestines. And so when we think of intestines, we think of, you know, the, the organs within our body that are basically like flushing out the toxins 
And so if you're, even if you're eating an animal, you know, eating an animal that's, un, that's clean, there's still parts of the body of the animal that we, I think, you know, we know, we, we automatically know the purpose and the function of that, that, that organ. And we would not necessarily, you know, partake of it because we, we understand the function its function even in the animal that is deemed clean so it's 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 um, really just huh? no i um i was speaking out loud i didn't realize i was still on so oh. when you finish when you finish no i was just saying we, we just it goes back again to just you know understanding that there, there's a purpose and a function for everything including the organs inside the animals and that you know we would we would the same way that we would we're being told not to partake of an you know of an unclean animal that is part of their purpose is to to rid you know to be this animal that is kind of the waste management of the right. environment that we would not still partake even with a clean animal a an organ within their body that also does the same thing so that is know. true that is true because mm -hmm. even our own livers are used to process toxins. But right. um, Leviticus chapter four, to be specific, okay? And this is with regards, I was referencing this, the sin offering. Leviticus three is the peace offering or the free will offering. It says, he shall remove all the fat, I'm sorry, reading from verse eight, Leviticus four, verse eight. He shall remove all the fat from the bull of the sin offering all the fat that is connected to the internal organs, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which you will remove with the kidneys. Verse 10, just as the fat is removed from the ox sacrifice as a fellowship offering, then the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. Now this is where we come to verse 11, Leviticus 4. But the hide of the bull and all its flesh, as well as the head and legs, the internal organs and the intestines, that is, all the rest of the bull, he must take outside the camp to a place ceremonially clean where the ashes are thrown and burn it there in a wood fire on the ash heap. Nobody eats that. Right. So Leviticus chapter four, does it, so the rest of it, And, and again, we encourage you guys to go back and reflect on these studies. Um, you know, Man. yes, we're here and we're studying and we are, we're, we're coming to teach and, and, you know, also learn from one another and being sharpened as well by the Holy Spirit. But we still encourage you to go back and study for yourself. We still encourage you to, you know, um, if you have any questions, um, go back and listen to the videos that are archived because, you know, there's there's so much and 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 um, you know, but at the same time, there's certain things that people and I'm not saying this and I'm not saying this in regards to what Sister Carolina was asking, but there's there's some things that we tend to like we'll ask and it it it, it gets a little deeper. It, you know, it's deeper as far as like, well, it, just like Sister Carolina, it's a legitimate question, you know, well, can we eat that? You know, it's a clean animal, but can we eat that? It's still, there's some, there's still parts of us that require us, you know, to be logical in a sense, you know, like, and I don't mean that in a bad way. What I mean is that there's certain things that even if it seems unclean, we know kind of subconsciously, hey, this is not probably something that I should eat. You know what I mean? This is not probably something that I should partake of and deem or refer as food. So, you know, it's it's like this prime example, like like just as an example, like the hooves of or the hooves of an animal, you know, the hooves is is the area of the animal that's like the foot or the hand, but it it you know, it's constantly on the ground. And so it's constantly, it could be stepping on manure, it could be stepping on this, it could be stepping on that. So you wouldn't necessarily probably, you wouldn't partake of the hooves 
I would say when you're, you know, if you're, if you're going to eat a clean animal, I just, some things are pretty like, you know, self-explanatory, like, Mm -hmm. you know, so I would just say that go back and study and, and, um, you know, still let's be mindful that we are very intelligent beings and, you know, certain things just would make sense and just wouldn't make sense if that's, if that, you know, if, if you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I think, hmm? no, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, sister, go ahead. I was going to say that um, I think um, what we have to understand that when we said yes to the Lord, first of all, we became new creatures, new creations in him. So our struggles of um, what to do and how to do and when to do, why to do, where to do, should not be as a struggle as we're struggling now, Um, you know, because we come under different laws and regulations. When I say laws, we're now we're now under on, on the kingdom mindedness, our thoughts, kingdom mindedness. So we we you know we we realize that our families are doing human sacrifice. We stop. You know, it's just the the food the food part is such an issue for us because even in my country you know, you eat the liver of the animal because it's supposed to be full of iron and they give it to um, pregnant people, iron. And they tell you that you get the most iron um, from the animal rather than eating spinach. That's what they try to say to you. So I think it's it's all based on if we if we really seriously bring it before the Lord and just ask him what is it i am to do because we began this not to convince anyone you know even though i think that there are a lot of things that are very plain but i see where we may get a little bit um disturbed because it's stuff that we're used to but remember that we are not we 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 should be allowing ourselves to walk away from what we consider used to and you know, be ready to live that set apart life. You know, the more and more I am looking at this issue with food, I can now see why the Lord gave us plants in the first place. Look at the confusion it has created that we're now asking, okay, should we eat the tail? Should we eat the head? Should we eat the eye? Should we eat the liver? Should we eat the kidneys? You know, and, and we have some reasons to why we can eat it. I mean, pig trotters is a pig feet and people eat the pig foot. But we learned the other day, the pig foot has a septic disposal to express pus out of his bodies, but we're eating it, you know, and it's supposed to be a delicacy, right? We have pickled pig feet, right? We have um, uh, uh, cow foot, right? It's a delicacy in my country. You eat the, 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 the skin portion, which we're told in scripture, burn it. So what do I do? God, man, got to make a choice. Got to make a choice. And of course, when you're always going this way, it's going to be hard. But his Holy Spirit will bring you back. I tell you this. You know, I challenge us. I'm not saying don't eat meat. But I challenge you to reduce your meat intake. And watch your system, how it processes and cleanses, that you won't yeah. have that congestion on the inside, that lethargy, that uh, um, that hunger desire, like you're led by your belly. You will see right. a difference. I tell you this because I know this to be true. Okay, when you start getting, uh, 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 you know, crazy about meat, And remember that a lot of the meat they have out there, it's not real. They got stuff in there. They sprinkle stuff in there for you to come and want to eat the stuff. Okay? Let us just 
focused on God, by the Holy Spirit, the revelation of the word, you will do what is right for you. Amen. We're going to... Um... We're going to try to get through the rest of it. I, we're going to get through the rest of this, but please, um, please don't want to do next is, week. <laughs> yeah. Well, a, um, lot of it, a, a lot of it in this, the next few, the next, the rest of the verses is pretty redundant. Um, so I'm going to read, I'm going to start from verse 25 and read through. Um, so uh, chapter uh, 11 of Leviticus, starting from verse 25, it says, "Everyone, uh, whoever picks up one of the one of the carcasses must wash their clothes, and they will be unclean until morning." Um, mm. Every animal that does not have a divided hoof or that does not chew the cud is unclean for you. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them will be unclean. Mm. Of all the animals that walk on all fours, those that walk on their paws are unclean for you. Whoever touches their carcasses will be unclean until evening. Anyone who picks up their carcasses must wash their clothes and they will be unclean till evening. These animals are unclean for you. Again, you know, it's it's not that they were unclean because they were now, you know, I what God was, was wanting to establish with his people was that even you coming into contact with anything that was unclean made you unclean to the point where because even it wasn't just enough for it to be unclean and him not wanting you to partake of it as a source of food but even if you touched it you were considered unclean and when you were considered unclean you were considered like you were looked upon differently in society when you were considered unclean, just like the women that when, and I, I think we'll get to this down, down the line, there was a way that women that had their menstrual work, you know, dealt with, um, but them on their menstrual were considered unclean. And we will get to that in future chapters, but you were, you were even deemed in society as, as you were distinguished um, in society when you were considered unclean. And so we in society don't even like the feeling of being ousted for an opinion that we have or, you know, something that we do or something that we say or, or something that we're wearing, you know, because all of us do desire this, this sense of acceptance. Even so, in a, and I think that God knows that about us. He knows that that's kind of our nature. And so even the thought of being unclean was like, I don't even want to be deemed as unclean, you know, uh, you know, even in society. So I, I, and I, and, and back in those ancient times, shame was a big deal. Like, and it's still a big deal, but it's more of a big deal in the East versus the West. Like we clearly have no shame, <laughs> but the thing is, is that, Shame was a big deal. So you did not want to bear shame and you could bear shame just from being deemed unclean. So for them, you know, having that, you know, having a clean status in a sense was, was, you know, honorable. So to, 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 to it wasn't just, God did not just want to establish with his people that you are not to partake of something that is unclean. Um, you know, you won't, even if you touch it, you will be deemed unclean to really differ, to really distinguish and separate that the, his people from anything that he deemed unclean so that they would not, the desire would not even be there at all. You know? Um, and again, I, I seeing the Seeing more the heart of God as I read the scriptures, I'm sure it was just for it to become a habitual thing so that over time, I don't even have to think about it. I don't even have to think about it. It's just not something I would even think about wanting to consume as a meat um, or partake of as a source of food. So hence why he says this. Um, he, he goes further down in chapter uh, 29 uh, through um 
I mean, through pretty much through the rest of the chapter, and I'm going to read a couple sentences. I'm going to read a couple of the the um, scriptures, um, and then I'm going to open it back up to Sister Lena. Um, but I definitely want to get through this. Um, it says in verse 29, of the animals that move along the ground, these are unclean for you. The weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko, the monster lizard, the wall lizard, the skink, and the chame uh, chameleon. Of all those that move along the ground, these are unclean for you. Whoever touches them when they are dead will be unclean till evening. When one of them dies and falls on something, that article, whatever its use, will be unclean, whether it is made of wood, cloth, hide, or sackcloth. Put it in water. It, put it in water. It will be unclean till evening, and then it will be clean. If one of them falls into a clay pot, everything in it will be unclean, and you will break the and you must break the pot. Any food you are allowed to eat that has come into contact with water from any such pot is unclean. And any liquid that is drunk from such a pot is unclean. Anything that one of their carcasses falls on becomes unclean. An oven or cooking pot must be broken up. They are unclean, and you are to regard them as unclean. A spring, however, or a cistern for collecting water remains clean, but anyone who touches one of these carcasses is unclean. If a carcass falls on any seeds that are to be planted, they remain clean. But if water has been put on the seed and the carcass falls on it, it is unclean for you. I just want to um, hone in a little bit on this. Now, it's amazing how when it mentions earlier up in verse 29 of the animals that move along the ground, these are unclean. And it mentions the weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the wall lizard, the skink, and the chameleon. And I'm reminded of the scripture in Genesis when it talked about the serpent, the serpent. And these types of animals, aside maybe from the weasel and the rat, the lizard, the chameleon, you know, the gecko, they have those serpent traits in a sense. Um, snakes, however, they, snakes do actually have, um, you know, hands, I guess, but they're so small, they're, 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 they're really, really small that you cannot see them. However, you can see the hands of the gecko, you can see the hands of the chameleon, you can see the hands of the lizard, but they have the same tendency, they have the same characteristics and actually fall in the same, um, they're, in the, they're of the same family species as the snake, and they are regarded as unclean. So again, here, you know, like, I mean, anybody who would want to eat them, I, I don't even know why you would want to eat them. But again, think about the nature of these, these, these animals. They crawl on the ground. The other thing from a spiritual perspective is they are the lowest of the lowest. They are the lowest creatures because they are the ones that literally, they, they're, uh, they, they move along the ground. So anything that falls to the ground, you know, they're moving along that. They probably feed off of that, you know, and it's just, you know, but when I consider the, the, the symbolically and spiritually the nature of these creatures, they are the lowest of the low. And what does it say about the, 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 the seed of the woman will that the heel of the of the woman's seed will bruise the head of the serpent. So how if if his head is going to be bruised by the heel of the seed of the woman, why would we partake of the, of, of of a creature that shares the same characteristic as the serpent, which is the one that caused that was behind man's fall in a sense. Mm -hmm. So crush his head. <laughs> yep. Yep. Destroy so, him. Uh, yep. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, I'm with I, you. I, I, I follow. To... Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that. I also wanted to share that, again, um, anything touching.
something that was dead, anything that touched a dead thing, whether it was a pot, whether it was clothing, whether anything that touched something dead was also deemed unclean. God really was adamant about the fact that he wanted things to be regarded as unclean so much that, again, it almost, I, I feel like this was almost to the point where it was like, because of all the conditions that could cause something to be unclean, you would be more than likely to just try to stay in great distance <laughs> from something that is deemed unclean. Because you don't want to take on the, the, the unclean nature, um, you know, in society. And you don't want, you know, pots had to be made. It was, it, everything was work back then. They had to make pots. They had to, you know, they had to draw water. They had to plant, you know, when they when they planted seed, they needed things to grow in order for more seed to be produced so that they could replant. So anything that came near, in a sense, everything that impacts their livelihood was put, put them what we would call in a deficit. So that's how much I'm sure God was like, that adamant, you don't want to touch anything unclean. You don't want to come into contact with anything unclean because this is how much it could be of a detriment and of a deficit to your daily life, you know? And so I'm sure that because of these types of restrictions, many people wanted to, to really stay away from the, the, you know, the things that were deemed unclean. Now I thought what was interesting was when it came to dry seed, it was kept clean. But if the seed came into contact with water, that's when it was deemed clean. Because think about it, sister, you can probably add to this. When you mix, if water got mixed, the, 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 main, the only thing that could still be deemed as clean when it came to water was something that was in a spring or a cistern because of the fact that the, the water was flowing. But anything that was like water in a, in, a, in a jar, it's still water. So it doesn't have any way of ridding of the contamination. Just like if we had water in a cup and blood got in it or a poison or something, you know, the flowing of water is what flushes the dirt. It flushes things away, just like when we wash our face. That water flowing on our face is what flushes the dirt off. It flushes off the impurities. But if, if the water's not flowing, it can't purify. So in the same case, the Lord said, even if something unclean comes in contact with flowing water, still clean. Even if something dead comes into contact with dry seed, it wasn't impact, like water didn't touch the seed. And that water, once it comes, you know, once that water comes out of, the, uh, of a pot or a cistern, it's also considered a still water, you know? So it can contaminate that seed. So I thought that was really interesting um, that even though something unclean came into contact with flowing water that it still remained clean and reminded me of the, the, the flow of uh, I, I could go somewhere else with that but I just thought that was amazing um, the, the beauty of, of flowing water as, a, as, as something that purifies it can never lose its ability to purify because it's, it's constantly flowing and I thought that was very beautiful that even a, something deemed unclean by God could never make unclean something that's, that's constantly flowing. It, it, it's living and it's, it's something that was created to purify, which water is a purifier. Amen. I don't know if you had anything to add, Sister, before I, before I move on to the last few scriptures. Okay. Um, I wanted to point something out here that... Uh, if we notice that um, the Lord doesn't want us to touch anything dead, okay? We are, we are children that serve a living God. And so he's trying to separate, uh, 
keep us separated from that which is dead. We know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of life, the gift of God is uh, unto eternal life. We also notice here that um, to make it clean, you have to wash. Wash meaning by water. We are made clean by the washing of the word. Is the word that cleanses us, the truth of the word that uh, we receive when we said yes, sets us free from, from sin and the wage of sin. Uh, also, when I'm looking at the clay pot and having it broken, it reminds me of um, in Ezekiel, uh, not Ezekiel, Jeremiah 18, when Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and the the um, the clay that was on the potter's wheel, what it was formed was not the perfect shape and form. So the Lord, uh, it was marred, it said. So the Lord destroyed it and began to form something that was what he desired. So I see that as in when we come in contact, you know, as, as righteous uh, saints of God, people that believe in the Lord, you have been saved and Holy Ghost sanctified and you come in contact to do something that is sinful, your foundation has to be restarted again. Amen. Um, so it keeps pointing us to stay away from that which is dead, that which kills, and, and to stay away from that which is decaying, uh, keeping us separated, and us going through the purification process. I'm looking also at where the seeds, the seeds, uh, the dry seeds that hadn't been planted yet and remain clean. Why? Because the water hasn't reach them, which would cause them to open up. So they have not been able to be contaminated. The ones where the seed has touched the water, where they begin to blossom, the, and the carcass falls on it, becomes unclean. This is like one that uh, uh, a newborn um, newborn baby Christian who who's, has the water of the word that is that they have received and they're now blossoming and then somebody comes with uh, maybe something that makes them feel uh insecure unwanted rejected and just pushes them away so now they have now been contaminated and are no longer clean and the lord is uh i think bottom line of all of this is separation we are called to be separate. And he's using these dead carcasses of animals. And it, we could easily be stuck on the animal portion. But I think when we look at things from the spiritual level, we're seeing where he's speaking about us. We're no longer amongst the dead. We've been given life through Christ Jesus by his shed blood. His blood that fell upon us. And instead of making us unclean, we become clean, clean through the washing of his word. And Jesus Christ is the word. And so the the old foundation is broken, is dismantled. And, and so now a new foundation is being built up. And it says that we are supposed to always be in that ready form as to be seeds and to also be seed scatterers. Amen. Thank you, sister. Yes. Um, last, the last few scriptures, uh, 39 through... Um, 47, and we're going to end with this. Um, it says, if any animal that you are allowed to eat dies, anyone who touches its carcass will be unclean till evening. Anyone who eats some of its carcass must wash their clothes, and they will be unclean till evening. Anyone who picks up the carcass must wash their clothes, and they will be unclean till evening. Every creature that moves along the ground is to be regarded as unclean. It is not to be eaten. You are not to eat any creature that moves along the ground, whether it moves on its belly or walks on all fours or on any feet. It is unclean. It's um, Again, I, I just want to reiterate that I think that's amazing that it, when it came to any creature that moves along the ground, they were all deemed unclean. Any creature. Just wanted to reiterate that again, just so that I thought that was very interesting. Um, verse 42, you are not to eat any creature that moves along the ground, whether it moves on its belly or walks on all fours 
or on or on many feet it is unclean do not defile yourselves by any of these creatures speaking mm-hmm. of the creatures that moved along the ground they were all unclean but he specifically said you defile yourself do not defile yourself by any of these creatures do not make yourselves unclean by means of them or made unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourself unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. These are the regulations concerning animals, birds, every living thing that moves about in the water and every creature that moves along the ground. You must distinguish between the clean and the unclean between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. Again, very interesting that the Lord, he's acknowledging these creatures moving along the ground as different in the sense Mm. that there's no unclean and no clean and unclean when it comes to these creatures that move along the ground. They are all unclean. And he even says that do not defile yourself with any of these creatures. And he Mm -hmm. consistently repeats himself. And I really believe it's because of the situation in the garden that the fact that the serpent deceived his creation Mm -hmm. into disobedience, which is caused them, which ultimately caused them to fall. And the nature of this creature became, I would say, so detestable to God that he became the lowest of all creation. Yes. So I just thought that was very, 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 very interesting. Um, And even when it comes to the animal that is clean, um, you know, the Lord said, if the carcass, if the animal dies, um, you know, you are not to partake of the animal that dies um, because if you, if you touch its dead car, if you touch its carcass, its dead carcass, it's already unclean. So even though it's a clean animal and it died, we remember it's unclean because it's it's a it's a dead carcass. So really interesting study um, on the clean and unclean. We went, I mean, there was so everywhere, much, everywhere, everywhere. But it was all it it all tied in with one another, and it was sure. very. Mm-hmm. necessary information sister like regarding it it was almost like we were getting a a deeper i don't want to say revelation but a, a deeper understanding of the foundation of creation all over again in a sense like it's like it's it's breaking down like we we were able to like break down part of maybe the reasoning behind God creating certain, certain um, creatures Mm -hmm. um, and Mm -hmm. living things and how Mm -hmm. we made it. And most people will make this a a food subject. What am I allowed to eat? What am I not allowed to eat? But we turned it into, well, by the help of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Mm -hmm. It was right. It wasn't just about, what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. So it's spiritual. Exactly. And how their purposes are important again, like we were saying yes. earlier. Yes. And our responsibility. Of yes. 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 So very, very great discussion, sister. I don't know if you have anything else to share, but I was really, I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed this chapter. I really enjoyed this stuff. It's after. it's it's full of stuff. I mean, I I still have the arguments I want to bring forth before we go, but I want to point something out yeah. as I'm looking at all the animals and the flying insects. Mm-hmm. I am I am likening them to different forms of sin. You know, um even the ones that creepy crawly, you know, it's so low and underfoot, it it easily can trip you up. You know, the bottom line is, the Lord is saying, stay away from that which 
would defile you, even touching right. the dead carcass. There's certain things you don't need to put your hands into. You don't need to get involved. You know, we are called to, to be clean. The washing of the word makes us clean. And as we go about living our lives, we'll see, you know, we too also have function and purpose. And we are not to, you know, um, allow ourselves to become where we are spreading death and and uh you know and um and multiplying that which is unclean in the earth when we're supposed to bring forth life and spread the the word of god so i i see it as um a reminder for us to remind us who we are a set apart people as it says in Romans 12, 1, that we're to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. A reasonable service is to remember, first of all, what our identification is. We're, we're identified with the kingdom of heaven, not with, with what's going on, on the earth, all of the pollution, the abomination. We are supposed to detest things. We're supposed to detest things, detest uh, that which is dead, that which is dying, that which is decayed, uh, that which is unclean, that which is perverted, that, that which is, we're supposed to detest these things, you know, and keep our minds and, 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 and head focused on God, the things of things above, not on the things on this earth. And remember that we are the seed of the woman who is sent forth to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Amen. So it's, it's a reminder. And, you know, that's why I'm glad you keep pointing it out. It's not about food. It's more than that. It's about us spiritually, our spiritual life, spiritual lifestyle, and the things that they come in, like even with pork, what are the pork within our, our spiritual walk that will cause us to compromise? You know, what, what is that thing just because we grew up with it? Like our sister was saying, you know, she grew up where her father was, you know, you could eat the eyes, you could eat this, you can eat that. It, you know, tradition tells us certain things are okay, but now the word has been exposed, broken down to us those things are not okay. We don't need to bring out these images and bow down to our dead grandmother and grandfather. No, turn away from it. But at the same time, you know, the spirit is housed inside of a body. And so that body also has purpose and we're given care of that body. We need to take care of that body, the physical body, and also the spiritual body. Amen. So. Let's deal with the uh, arguments. I had some arguments here because uh, there's a lot of things that's been spoken. As to say that Leviticus 11 means nothing, it's Old Testament. And so I want to present back to us some of the arguments that I've heard with regards to um, with regards to Leviticus 11. And one of them is that, you know, God gave us meat to eat. Okay. And from last week, you know that our meat for food, even in Leviticus chapter two, I think it was, or three, I could be wrong, I don't remember. When it was talking about the meat offering, it was actually referring to the grain offering. But in this case, they're saying God gave us meat to eat. And when they say God gave us meat to eat, they're taking us back to the book of Numbers. I'm sorry, uh, Exodus 16, when the quail was uh, brought in for us when we were complaining. And that is uh, brought in more detail in the book of Numbers chapter 11. Uh, there was the murmur. Uh, the people murmured unto, unto Moses and Aaron that uh, it would have been better if they were back in Egypt when they were sitting before the flesh pots and eating meat. But let me bring us back to Exodus 16 real quickly. Okay, I'm going to read from verse uh, 1 to 13. It says, uh, Exodus 16, 1 to 13. I'm going to be as quick as I can with these um, arguments, that just bringing them forth to give thought. Amen. It says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, 
On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israel community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appear in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Now, you would think if you just remain there and be stuck, that that's the end of the story. No, the rest of the story is in Numbers chapter 11. Okay, and it begins at verse four, Numbers 11, verse four, where it reads, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. That tells you that the Lord started giving them manna, right? Then they wanted something else. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in the handle. Tells you about the preparation. But then it says in verse 10, Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents. The Lord came exceedingly, became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell them to tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. Okay. And I see this meat as in, you know, we want to do what we want to do. We want to have what we want to have, even though it's no good for us. So here now, if we look at verse, uh, same numbers 11, and we look at verse 17, I'm sorry, uh, verse 18. Let's start at verse 18. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, 10 or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? The meat they were asking for, the quail that the Lord brought into them, they ate more than they even wanted to eat. They could not prevent themselves because they were just eating it till it came out of their nostrils. You know, that is what sin does. Sin causes us to desire things that is unhealthy for us, not good for us. And sin will cause death because what happened? People died. People died. This numbers, um, numbers, 30, numbers 11, verse 31 to 35. Now a wind 
went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. He scattered them up to two cubits deep all around the camp, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 omers. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat, verse 33, numbers 11, was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, while they have ripped into it before they could chew it and enter into their throat down into their belly, it says the anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibra Hatava because there they buried the people who had craved other food. The wages of sin is death. Okay? Sin comes uh, tasty. It will cause you to lust. It will cause you to steal. It will cause you to fall into that state of slumber. And you're thinking, oh, it's okay. The Lord gave us meat. That's what they say. And he did send meat in, but it was not his choice. He didn't want to give us meat. He gave us coriander seed, but we didn't want what God gave us because it was too plain. Even though scripture tells us that it was sweet, that like tastes like honey. And another one tells us that, um, tells us that it tastes like oil. This is what they have been telling us about the walk of Christianity. It is too plain. There is no fun. There is no joy in it. And so they start to mix it all up. And what has happened? What, what we have is a bride whose garment is stained with her period. Amen. We eat meat. Argument number two. All foods are clean and you can eat anything. And they use in Acts chapter 10, verse 9 to 16, which tells a story about Peter. About noon, the following day, as they were on their journey, these were um, some people from Cornelius's house coming to get Peter. And they were approaching the city, the Joppa. Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being led down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. They have used this argument to say that because they had all these unclean animals on this sheet that was let down, all different kinds of reptiles, crawling things that crawl on the ground that is rendered unclean. And because the Lord said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. The key is this. Peter said, sure do not, Lord, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The Lord did not, he, he was not condemning Peter's diet. The Lord himself followed that same diet. The Lord didn't come to do away, but to fulfill the law. Peter walked in that Nazarite law. He didn't eat anything unclean. What the Bible said was that the Lord said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. What has he made clean? Sinful man. By the death of his son, Jesus Christ, and his blood that was poured on, on Calvary's cross is what made us clean. And he was talking about the Gentile house of Cornelius that Peter was going to be entering into and to see how God received them. Church, we have been seduced by a lie to tell us that because Peter, that thing that came down before Peter in his dream, and the Lord said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. That, that means that God is sanctifying what he called unclean. And now God's going to change his mind. No. But you decide that. Argument number three. No man should judge you of what you eat. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. Or with regard to a religious festival, 
a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Key. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Christ, he, the word, the living word on the inside of us. When we say yes, yes, we cannot just eat whatever. But he says for us not to lift it up to be such a God to us. Like some of us, we can't. Uh, have sit before dinner unless we have meat. Meat got to be on it. It is paramount that we have meat on the table. All right. So it becomes like a God. But when you have Christ in you, you are concerned about what you're putting inside of your belly. All right. You are concerned of what you eat or drink. There needs not be any judgment because we will judge ourselves before we are judged. That is what it says. The reality, however, is found in Christ and is found in Christ through his word. Argument number four. What good what is good for you is not good for me. Just do you and let me be me. Romans 14. Verse 11, I'm sorry, Romans 14, verse 20. And that begins from verse 11 to 23. But I'm only going to do verse 20 for the sake of time. It says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. Okay, so... If you look at from verse um, 11 through, it will tell you about uh, every knee shall bow, every tongue must confess that uh, Jesus is Lord and we are called to give an account of ourselves to God. And it says for us not to present any stumbling blocks. What is a stumbling block? Remember, food is considered as sin. OK, so we need to be we need to be careful. What is it that we are consuming so that we do not present a stumbling block before somebody? Somebody is that is struggling with alcoholism. We don't sit at dinner with them and we have wine. We do not we do not make the work for someone else to be difficult. When he's saying that all food is clean, is saying that what God has given us to eat that he's considered to be clean. It is clean and it remains clean. However, in that eating, clean eating, you do not try to uh, um, uh, make someone's walk to be harder for them. Remember that when the Lord is saying all food is clean, when, when the scripture says all food is clean, you're not saying for you to eat what is considered unclean and make it clean. And remember, we've already dealt with this scripture. All right. Argument number five. It says it's Old Testament. It's an old covenant, not the New Testament and not new covenant because Jesus said all foods are clean. OK, they're saying that the Old Testament enslaved us under the law. I'm looking at uh, God questions. They had a, a question asked about uh, can people eat shrimps, uh, shrimp and all that. So they said we were enslaved under the law. People were stuck in the old covenant, relying on a sacrificial system that looked forward to the coming of Christ and justification by faith. OK, and supporting scripture for this enslaved under the law, Galatians 3, verse 19 to 26, which reads, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. It is the law, therefore, is the law, therefore, opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law. Why? Because we didn't know what sin was until the word was revealed, right? Locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So 
verse 24. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we're no longer under guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you're all, you are all children of God through faith. God sent his son. Yes, we were now, we were born under the law, but redeemed by Christ. Amen. And so they say now that we, according to Galatians 4, verse 3 to 5, so also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. So they're saying by Christ's birth, we're no longer under the law. So we can now do whatever. It canceled all of the, the indebtedness, which include all of the sacrifice and all of the requirements for us not to eat pork, not to eat any uh, scavengers. We can just eat whatever we want and it is all. Okay, that is what they're saying for us. Okay, and they say now, according to Mark chapter 7, verse 19, right? And, and I'm going to read from verse 18 to 19. It says, are you so dull? He asked, don't you see that nothing enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out the body. Then it reads, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. But that's the NIV. If you look at the King James verse 19, it says it because it entered not into his heart, but into the belly and go it out into the draught, purging all meats. The Bible, what the Lord is referencing is our internal system, our internal cleansing system, just like every animal that has a stomach. We have a stomach. We have a liver. We have a kidney. When anything comes through the mouth, there are there are bacteria inside of us. We have, uh, you know, the toxins within us that breaks down the food. Amen. And so it purges it out so that the body is able to receive what the body is to receive and the rest of it goes out into the draught. What they're saying and interpreting it is that the Lord now has proclaimed all foods clean, misinterpreting scripture. What the Lord was speaking about was food, but let's apply it now to the spirit man. Okay. What you're receiving, because remember the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, whatever is in the heart, the mouth will speak and it now contaminates you. But remember, the Bible says, as the Lord spoke, he said, what enter into your mouth when you eat the food itself, it doesn't go into the heart. It goes into the stomach, into the, the, the system of the belly where it is broken up. But when you, sin enters you, it goes into the heart and it contaminates the body. It is not saying that food is clean. No, the Lord is saying the food itself is purged by the system in our bodies and whatever the excess is, is expelled out through the drought. What is our drought? It is the anus. Amen. We need to look clearly at scriptures. Matthew 15, 17 says, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body. Yet they are using Mark 7 verse 19 to proclaim that Jesus says that you can eat anything and it is clean. When his word clearly says not one twiddle out of his word, as it says in Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19, don't add anything, don't take away anything. So if he begins in Leviticus 11, are you saying then that the word of God in Leviticus 11 is of no of no consequence? No, that is a lie. When Jesus entered into the temple, he said, here the words are now fulfilled before you today. He read the word before the people. Church, let us not allow the enemy to blind us, deaf us, and cause us to compromise. Amen. We say in first Corinthians, as it says in first Corinthians uh, chapter six, verse 12, it says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by it. I like what the King James says. It says, but I will not be brought under the power of any as one that's crawling on her belly. 
they refuse because of what the corruption of the enemy because of my physical meat and my spiritual meat that i am going to allow the enemy to now bring me down low to be as one crawling on my belly when god is giving me two feet that i can stand or i can bow down and shaha before him no 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 as it says in verse 13 you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food and god will destroy them both the body however is not meant for sexual immorality it's talking again looking at the natural to shed light on us for the spiritual because we are inhabiting natural bodies and we need to take care of this temple church we have allowed the enemy to corrupt our minds amen and so we now figure because we cannot realize that we have now taken on a rebellious attitude, a rebellious attitude when we now say and even use scripture to say to ourselves, God has put a seal on it. No, he has not put a seal on it. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And if we will even open our eyes just for a little bit, just to see, we will be able to recognize the truth. As it ended in Leviticus 11, verse 47, what does it say? You must be able to distinguish. Let's go back. Leviticus 11 and verse 47, the last, very last verse. You must distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. There are men and women walking around. They are of the dead. They're dead, okay? They're not of us. They are sons of the daughters of the serpent, okay? They are with enmity with us church we need to keep our eyes on the prize and we need to stop allowing the enemy to be able to throw the spell over our minds to cause us to now cast aside the word of god for our belly as he said the belly was made for food but the belly also has a system that processes the food and receives what is good and spits out what is bad we now need to have a spiritual belly to process what we are receiving what we are connecting with so that we only receive that which god has given that's why this says in john he says to try every spirit and to see if it is of god Need I say any more? Mm -hmm. Think about it. We can eat anything. God gave us meat. That's what we say. No man should judge us. And we take the scripture. But what is the understanding? When we are found in Christ, we have the truth. And the truth will set us free. Every day is a day where we're walking our salvation out with fear and trembling. Uh, do not feel bad that you may be eating something that you're feeling convicted about. Joy in the Lord to say that today the opportunity has been given to me for me to cast that aside. No more contaminating my spirit nor my flesh with that. I no longer have to carry on that characteristic. I am not a garbage compactor. I am not a septic tank system. I'm a child of God. And I must mm -hmm. now be mindful of what goes in my belly and also what goes into my spirit belly, my spiritual belly. And that's why the scriptures reference that out of our bellies, think of it, shall flow rivers of living water. And what did it say about the cistern? It is clean, right? Because the water is flowing. Yep. Yep. Flowing. Go ahead, sister. You had something to say? No, I was just agreeing with you. Amen. 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 That's it for me. That's it. Go back. Read the scriptures through. Let me give you back one last time the scriptures for the, um, the, scriptures for the arguments. 
that the Lord gave us meat. Look at is Exodus 16, verse 1 to 13, Numbers 11, 4 to 24, and 31 to 35. God gave us meat. Go read scripture for yourself and see. Did God give us meat? Remember what he said before we could chew it, while it was still yet in our mouth. A plague was unleashed. Argument number two, all foods are clean. Acts 9 to 16. Even though scripture explained to us that the Lord was talking about the Gentiles, but we have somehow found a way to equate it, that Peter was able to eat reptiles and four-footed animals and birds. And what was unclean? And Peter is like, I never, the Lord never condemned Peter's diet. No. What the Lord was speaking about was way beyond food. He's talking about souls of men. Amen. Yeah. Argument number three. No man should judge you of what you eat. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. Remember what he says. The reality found in Christ. The reality found in Christ. Argument number four. What's good for you not, is not good for me. Just go do you and let me be me. Romans 4, verse 11 to 23. It says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Your desires are not supposed to drive you away and pull you, seduce you, take you away where you now are contaminated. It says, all food is clean. But it is wrong for a person to, to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. Start from the top. And you will see it's not talking about food. It's talking about the soul of man. And what God gave us to eat was always clean animals, not unclean. Go back to scripture, read, listen back to last week's Leviticus part 11, part one. And our final argument is Old Testament, Old Covenant, not new. It's not the new covenant, not New Testament, and that Jesus said all foods are clean. Amen. We looked at uh, Galatians 3. 19 to 26, Galatians 4, 3 to 5, Colossians 2, 13 to 14, Colossians 2, 20 to 23. And the meat of it, Mark 7, verse 18 to 19, and Matthew 15, verse 17. They use the scripture to say that the Lord has sanctified all, all foods to be clean. When he was talking about food going into your belly and that he had provided a system that's at work. He also did provide for us a system called the Holy Spirit that's in our belly, a spiritual belly that's at work to purge us from all unrighteous works. To purge us from all unrighteousness, from past sins. Washing us, but through the washing of the word. It says it's cast out. So we are delivered, set free from generational holes, strongholds, familiar spirits, all that contamination, witchcraft and sorcery. That's the work that's been done in us. Let us, church, get it right so that we are not brought under the power of sin. First Corinthians 6, verse 12 to 20. Keep that in mind. And let the spirit of the Lord have his way. Our aim is that we all come into the knowledge of who Christ is and what his desires for us. And what is that? For us to be cleansed. Remember, he's coming for a bride without spots, without blemish, without wrinkles. And she's not hemorrhaging. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Sister Jen or Sister Caroline, do you guys have anything before we close? I do not, Sister. Amen. Amen. So go ahead, Sister Carolina. No, I was just going to agree and say no. That was an awesome teaching by the both of you. Got me throwing away some things in the freezers. <laughs> <laughs> 
tell you. You know, when I was laid down and I was thinking about that thing I had in there. I cleaned out my fridge the other day. The only thing I left was that liver. But as I was listening to you, I kept feeling this pull and I would ignore it, feeling this pull and I'd ignore it. I said, all right, Lord, I'll throw away the liver. (laughs) I threw away the liver. Praise the Lord. Which liver is that, sister? It was beef liver. You know, um, I think if we really look at the system of the stuff that we eat, like even the liver and look at it and see how it, what it processes, it, it, it will... I think it may help us a little bit to understand more what we are ingesting, you know, just like we are, uh, we are being careful of, uh, you know, um, gatherings that we're around people that we associate with. It's no different than when we're eating the different parts of, of, of the animal. Is, is contamination. And I know to somebody else out there, they may be like, oh, these people are so religious. You know, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine for you to think that we are being religious. It's okay. Maybe for you, it's not, it's, you know, maybe for you, you know, you want to stick with the, the skin and the skin tastes good. That's fine. You know, but thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. He never gives up on us. You know, for myself, when he brought me out, believe me. When he brought me out, I like to have, I only ate like chicken breast and stuff like that because I like fine meat and I like lamb and stuff like that. But when he, he brought me out and made me into a very strict diet where I don't eat any meat at all. You see in Leviticus 11, you can't eat meat. I am brought to just to eat the, um, you know, uh, just the fish and the vegetables and and anything coming out of the ground. So I'm following much more a Nazarite diet, but it was my choice. I was placed on that, right? And God bless my husband because he's learned to eat eat it because it's easier to cook this than this meat. And then he's the only one sitting there looking at it, you know, so I, I give God thanks for him. But, you know, we have been told that what we need for our bodies, we need to get it from meat. That's a, that's a system that's going to be hard for us to separate ourselves from. So you may find yourself running to it. Just let God, you know, if he's convicted you, let him lead you through, right? Some of us can just like that. Others, it will take time. But as he opens your eyes, as he opens your eyes, do not allow the enemy to cover them. You keep them open to say no. Remember, as the scripture says, the reality is found in Christ. And by Christ, which means in his word. And his word will never return void. And his word, he says, not one drop shall be blotted out. Not one drop shall be added onto. So if he said it in Genesis, and we come to Revelation, don't you think it's also part of Revelation? Yes, he's the same. Let us shake off all those lies. Amen. Praise God. So let us bow our heads. Father, we just want to thank you for this night. Pray, Lord, that your word went forth without condemnation. But, Lord, with conviction. Conviction is good. Lord, even if it chastens us, that's good because it shows that you love us. I pray for all of us, oh, Father God, that are struggling, Lord God, with not just what goes into the belly in our natural selves, but what goes into the belly of our spirit, man. I pray, oh God, that, Lord, that our eyes that have been open will remain open, and our ears that have been shut and have been open will remain open, and our heart, Father God, Lord Jesus, that, Father, that has been contaminated, has been washed and cleansed, oh God, and we've been made brand new, that you are, Lord God, you're broken the part, the foundation of that, Father, of the error, Lord God, of of traditions, of customs, Lord God, of man-made vows, Lord God, Father, man-made laws, as they said that they had went ahead, Lord, and even to add onto your word in Leviticus 11 and said, anything that has scales is fine. Dear God, what have we done? 
but thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh God, that continues to flow even now, over 2,000 years later, to bring redemption. Lord God, you don't want us amongst the dead. So you're calling us. You have made us clean through the washing of your word. As you said unto Peter, do not call what I have made clean, unclean. You have made us clean by the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the washing of your word. Because there is three that bear there's three that bear witness in the earth. That is the water, the blood, and the spirit. So, Father, oh, even as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bear witness in heaven, may you bear witness in the earth today, Lord God. Father God, that this word will not be consumed away by any unclean bird. Lord God, it, it will not be eaten by tears, Lord God. Father God, Lord, you want to fall upon rocky grounds, but upon fertile grounds, Lord God, where we have seeds that are ready for planting, seeds to grow into trees, trees to bear fruit, meat fit for the kingdom. I give you thanks, O God, for the time that you spent with us. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you'll continue to water on the seed of this word. Oh, Father God, that indeed we ourselves, our families, our loved ones, those near, dear, far. Lord God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for our health. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. And amen. So this is where we say, church, so good to see us all. Here ends another night of GFM, Friday night's Law and Order, Leviticus chapter 11. Next week, I think we're going to have to do two scriptures because it's a short one. Leviticus 12 is very short. So we're going to go into Leviticus chapter 12 and 13 for next week, the 29th of October for week number 13. 38. Amen. So October 29, 2021. Thanks to everyone tuning in here on Zoom, out there on uh, Facebook and YouTube. We love you. Thank you for hanging with us. And those of you that were not able to uh, catch this in the archive. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, Sister Jen. Thank you so much. You Thank brought you. such, you too, sister. especially with that, that bat. Ooh. Mm. Thank so you. It's perfect, though. <laughs> yes, it did. Amen. God bless you. Love you all. Ta ta. Love you. T -t -i.